huge, huge cat. He's massive. I bet you that cat. I don't see a collar. That might that might be what's killing all the birds. I hope you can hear me. This is the first cottage show of the year, so we're testing the audio. Can I get some audio feedback, please? And thank you. That's my imitation of Eric Woods. Can you hear my Eric Woods voice? No, it's not very good. That wasn't very good. It's a beautiful day here at the cottage, aside from that cat that just, I swear to God, it was huge. It was like something out of Game of Thrones. Audio good, says Rob Daniels. Okay, so I'm just going to show you real quick what a beautiful day it has been. Yeah, that's right. I almost lost my glasses in the water, but uh, luckily that was just my backup pair. This is the new pair. I can see again. It's wonderful. It is wonderful. And it's wonderful to be here. And I can't wait to start talking Star Wars with our special guest tonight. I was just watching uh, just before the show and during dinner, I was watching The Phantom Menace and I made some impromptu notes that I'm going to add to tonight's show. Be aware, this is not a uh, child friendly uh, program tonight. There will be swearing. I guarantee it because I wrote the words down on the page. I basically wrote down what I was yelling at the screen while I was watching the movie. And uh, now I'm here. Tonight's uh, drink sponsor is uh, we have a Tim Hortons large regular. And for when we need to cool down, we will be drinking Canada Dry ginger ale. And tonight we will be ranking all 11 theatrical Star Wars films with my good friends. Harrison Kopp, Rob Daniels, and Eric Woods. And we are going to have an awesome time because these are three guys who love Star Wars as much as I do. And um, I know I know that opinions are going to be split on some movies between the younger generation and the older generation. But I also have uh, two guest lists, one from Uncle Meat, who refused to appear tonight because he'd rather get drunk with Max the Axe. And uh, one from Michael Morwood, who could not be here tonight because he's in Toronto seeing Primus. So that's two good, well, one good reason not to be here and one eh kind of reason not to be here. I mean, you can drink with Maxi Axe anytime, but anyway, let's get the show on the road and I will bring on my three guests tonight.
one-way ticket to anywhere. And a glazed donut. To go, to go. <laughs> this guy. There you go. How are you fellas doing tonight? Good. Good. Loud and clear. Great. How are you? How are you, Harrison? I am well, thanks. Although I'm not sure I can say the same after all the lists I'm gonna have to hear. <laughs> we'll see. Um Uncle Meat also wants me to tabulate the lists. At first he volunteered to do it himself, and then all of a sudden now he's drinking with Maxi Axe tonight. So hmm. I'll be doing all these duties all at once. So uh, just to go around, I see we've all chosen Star Wars themed names. We have Harrison Kopp as Darth Contrarian tonight. Uh, Eric Woods as Mace Woodsu. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, uh, Rob has been cast as Han Solo, it seems, by T-Bone. So he's Bob Solo tonight. Yeah. Welcome, guys. Thanks. Looking forward to this. Yeah. I just want to start with a quick round of questions. Uh, we'll start with Harrison. Tell me the very first time you saw a Star Wars, roughly your age. It's hard to say, but I have Star Wars uh, memorabilia, basically, and like magazines from 2005 from the Revenge of the Sith era. So I would have been four or five. Okay. And I uh, would have seen pretty much all the six by then at that point. Okay. Uh, Shit, I forgot to get the stuff. Never mind. <laughs> How about you, Mace Wutsu? I was uh, seven. I saw Return of the Jedi first um, at the, I want to say it's the York Theater or the University Theater in Toronto. It was just a massive theater, two-story theater, red seats, huge red curtain over across the, the screen. And so, yeah, um, that's when I first experienced it. And I saw the original trilogy backwards. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah. And, uh, and Bob. I was six when, uh, in 1977, um, when Star Wars came out, it was in May, so I wasn't quite seven yet, but uh, I saw it at the Highland Theater um, way back in 77, so yeah. I was... I'm old. <laughs> yeah, same here. I was five in 1977 when my dad brought home from... From, uh, he worked at Stanley Park Mall. He brought home from the mall that day a coloring book with Star Wars in it. And uh, this was the newest thing. And I begged to go to the movie and they took me and it was sold out. My mom and dad said, no seats left. And I said, that's fine. I'll sit on the floor. And they did. I didn't understand why that wasn't okay. Um, so we came back another time and saw Star Wars and I was over the moon, you know, and we probably saw it. I, I seem to remember as kids seeing each Star Wars movie three times theatrically. That's my story. So um, tonight we're ranking all of them, all the saga films, all of the uh, the two spinoffs. I you know, I do have one minor nitpick with your your choice of just eleven theatrical, <laughs> because I actually did see the Clone Wars theatrically. Yes, back oh, wow. to back. Uh, so yeah, I saw it in Midland, uh, of all places, Midland, Ontario. That's an interesting. Yeah. Didn't, so, they have a movie theater, apparently. Yes, actually, they have quite a large movie theater. Yeah. I, I I guess somewhat arbitrarily decided to dis uh, not include that one. Um, I was aware. Yeah, that no worries. Did, I I I uh, I have I will register your complaint in the big book of complaints <laughs> here. But I I guess unless Harrison or unless you are able to do the tabulation tonight, I got to do it all. Afraid not. My uh, all right. I'm a bit cluttered here at the moment. No space to put stuff all right i you see I, i'm just recently i've been suffering from a, an acute case of running out of space <laughs> you may be much, able to tell from behind me too yeah. much lego i know i yes i sympathize i sympathize all right i i'm making a mess on my pages already okay so harrison eric 
Would you like to chronicle Michael, Meat, and Catherine as well? You know what? No. Uh, Meat has decided not to appear tonight. That's his choice. Mm -hmm. Tough luck. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how the, this. Uh, I'm not very good at this. Um, if you fuck. want me to do it, I'll do it. It's you know up what, to you. Would, you. would you mind? I've got. I I've find got his paper this pen. lack of meat disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. You know it. it Oh, he sends in a list. He he Facebooks me a list, and he's like, "Oh, this is so. Uh, there's something different instead of you know all four guys agreeing with each other." And I'm like, "Okay, whatever." But agree. Why don't we Funny start? One. Why don't we start? And and Eric, you don't have to record these lists. These are just for for interest sake. Why don't we start with Michael Morwood, who could not be here tonight because he is out seeing Primus. Hmm. All right, I from have eleven to, read to off. one. Okay, so starting, we have The Last Jedi, The Rise of Skywalker, The Force Awakens, Attack of the Clones, The Phantom Menace, Solo, Revenge of the Sith, Return of the Jedi, A New Hope, Rogue One, and The Empire Strikes Back. And that's probably the most standard of the lists I think we'll see tonight as they come. Or oh, sorry, not the most standard, but as standard as they come. For, for his particular age group that's exactly the list i would expect but hmm. let's see what eric has to say eric hmm. litwiller all right so starting the rise of skywalker revenge of the sith the last jedi rogue one attack of the clones solo is that solo six yeah solo six for both of them the phantom menace the force awakens a new hope return of the jedi and the Empire Strikes Back. I find his Revenge of the Sith disturbing, but... Uh, oh, yeah, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> Interesting couple of lists there. Uh, Michael, like I said, I, I find Michael's to be kind of what you'd expect, given hmm. the the, uh, the age group he's in. You know, they really seem to love... They're of the age group where they, they're starting to appreciate the prequels in a way that maybe the rest of us didn't at the time. But I guess we'll see. I don't want to talk about I that I mean, yet. he put Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones 7 and 8 above yeah. the sequels only. I thought his list was more in line with the older generation, you guys, basically. Well, maybe not with me, but we'll get there. Why don't we start with the uh, the Nigel Tufnell Top 10. Oh, yeah. um, so, Eric, are you ready to record the... the uh, the tabulations tonight we're all here ready to go okay all right so let's do this harrison cop you are going to begin after we run the song All right, I promise I'm not going to be too ranty tonight, but this number 11 entry sort of gets my blood boiling a bit. Um, the Force Awakens. Now, my thoughts on this film are, you know that scene in Endgame where Ancient One... Um, is talking to Banner and she shows him like the time stream. Then she removes the stone and you get this dark time stream coming off. That's the fourth awakens to me because it sets the whole sequel trilogy up in the worst way possible Just sends it off in the wrong trajectory. Like people like to say, Oh, the last Jedi was so disrespectful to Luke and everyone else. And yet nobody seems to like think that, you know, maybe insinuating that the people who lived through the empire fought the Empire, fought so hard, made so many sacrifices, and finally beat them in Return of the Jedi, maybe they would not let the Empire rise again, you know? that Maybe they have a level of competence at ruling that wouldn't let the First Order, you know, basically Empire 2.0 come up. Like, The Force Awakens basically annuls the entire original trilogy, basically. Anakin's sacrifice, that great ending at the end of Return of the Jedi, who cares? Out the window, it's gone. It's just back to where they, back to square one in The Force Awakens. And then to top it all off, they just go and redo A New Hope. They don't even try anything new. 
you know so i just really don't like how it set the sequel trilogy up in like in my opinion the worst way possible with the worst possible story but it helped and it's sort of like this is why i'm not as hard on the rest of the sequels because i'm like well they made the best with what they got okay <laughs> I, I, I'm, every point you made is valid I'm yeah not gonna argue well said you. sure i guess i guess i if i and I don't want to spend too much time bantering back and forth, but I guess if I just mm. wanted to say two things, um, I got more the impression that it wasn't necessarily the rebels generation that let things slide. I got the impression it was more the next generation. That's just me. Um, and I forgot the other thing. So go. <laughs> so, so why don't we move on to Mace Woodsu? Uh, number 11 is the rise of Skywalker. Easily one of the most incompetent film of the entire uh series it is the thing is it kind of pulled the wool over my eyes when i first saw it because i thought all right that was entertaining but then as i started thinking about it more and more during that night um within two hours i pretty much thought that it was a big steaming pile of crap <laughs> and um there are some there's some interesting scenes. I think the the Falcon flight at the beginning is a lot of fun. All the new worlds that they're hyper jumping to. I kind of wish we were visiting those worlds in the film, especially that weird mirror universe, which just completely screwed up with my mind. Um, and that was just I've, I've actually gone through and looked at that frame by frame just to see what was happening and what they were doing, because it was a really unique world that I would have liked to have seen and explored more but um the whole retcon of the last jedi was utterly disrespectful and as much as i didn't like the last jedi i thought that okay you can take elements from that film and push the story forward for instance this should not have been a palpatine film it should have been kylo ren absolutely going crazy and totally evil and on top of that, explaining why Ray is such a weak, we'll say Jedi, but um, force sensitive person. And I thought one of the best scenes in the movie, which they retconned two minutes later, was her getting angry, blowing up that cargo ship with Chewie in it. I gasped and I thought, oh, my God, they had some balls to do that. And then within two minutes, Chewie's dead. There is no consequence for anything that happens in this movie. And uh, one of the most egregious things was the Rilo kiss, which made no sense. Uh, but Palpatine, we've already seen him as a bad guy. He's boring. He's dull. Did the exact same thing that he did when he fought Mace Windu uh, to, in, in order to destroy himself. Um, it was just stupid. Uh, they... The problem, the biggest problem is that they didn't have a plan with the sequel trilogy. And that's why you have such inconsistencies in The Last Jedi, but especially in The Rise of Skywalker, when you have J.J. Abrams trying to fix things that probably didn't need to be fixed. You could have continued that story on and made it something, but now it's a movie I never want to see ever again. Wow. Wow. I I admire your level of detail that you want to see. <laughs> you know, and again, I don't think hate. I, like we can. Here's the thing: is that I Ooh. we're all we're just two people Ooh. into this discussion, and I'm agreeing with you, even though I don't agree with your rankings at all. I'm understanding where you're coming from, and I can't really. I'm not going to rebut yeah. any of that because you're not. You're right. <laughs> your, hate, your hate makes you powerful. Yeah, hate yeah you. <laughs> absolutely. I'd be turning the dark side right now just based on that. So maybe he's yeah. Darth Woodsu, but anyway. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I was thinking that. I was thinking of like Count Woodsu for Count Dooku or oh, that yeah. would have worked. Yeah, probably. Yeah, but I was thinking worked. the bald head. Mm -hmm. Um I didn't want to change the color <laughs> of my skin because I didn't want to get canceled. So <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> anyway, 
Wrong. I don't tend to go on and on, sorry, just about like yep, stuff no that like I would have preferred something to be like, but I thought it would have been interesting in Rise of Skywalker if Rey had stayed dead, basically all of the Jedi dying with all of the Sith, you know, a new beginning, and then having Kylo getting to live on, live with his mistakes and try to be a better person in the future. Yeah, I thought it. I think it would have been a little better that way. The ending, that, but that's not, not enough that's to salvage daring. the film, of course. Yeah. But that's being daring, and you can't sell any Ray toys with a dead Ray. <laughs> um, you know, but I mean, yeah, there there were some interesting stories to be told, especially after the Last Jedi and her um, being lured by Kylo Ren and being lured so easily that I thought that her turning would have been really, really interesting, and to see how she might have got out of that. And if she didn't, or I don't know, but that just would have been way more interesting than her just following almost a similar hero structure, even though that was poorly done in this movie. She didn't earn anything. That's the problem. She didn't earn anything and her story wasn't told well. No, I personally would have preferred if she didn't turn one because it would be predictable to me and it would leave us, I think, with a bit of a lopsided power level on terms of bad guys to good guys, you know, two force users against, you know, some blaster people. Yeah. I don't know, but they messed it up. So, well, Bob, I'm curious what your <laughs> least favorite Star Wars movie is. Well, What can I say? It's the Rise um, of Skywalker, isn't it? No, actually, no. no surprisingly, I was going to say, "Wow, a lot of uh, Rise of Skywalker hate here." But mm -hmm. for me, I found this film dull, boring, and much like sand, it gets <laughs> everywhere. Attack of the Clones, for me, is just bottom of the barrel i thought there were moments where it just dragged so much and i'm not expecting it to be like an empire strikes back middle section but there were the stakes in my opinion just were not there it was more or less just a uh let's let's get to the last film and um, I, I will, I will say, and I will stand behind this: that the first two films are useless. They really tell a story that really did not need to be told. That being said, however, I have softened on the on the on the prequel trilogy a bit after watching it again with a with a, a friend of mine. And yes, yes, you're hearing a meowing cat. That is that is Gimli. He may pop up every once in a while, so you will see him. In any case, uh, like I said, I have softened on the prequels. Not a lot, but I can so kind of see where they were going with it. You'll hear this a lot tonight. Um, lost potential. And that's that I think is... Hmm. <laughs> I thought they I'm smelled from the outside. I can't. I can't, uh, I, I can't compete with that Eric line. So I'm just going to say, it's not gonna Rob, you, number eleven. <laughs> you and I have famously been on the same wavelength a lot of times, but um, let's just say not today. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, Rob. If there was no Rise of Skywalker, I'm with you. So the the thing about Here's the thing I'm, I'm going to say that I'm going to actually agree with you is that I am somewhat warming back to the prequels because of how bad the, the sequel trilogy was. Yeah. Um, just because it had a plan. It had but plan. It had ideas. There was world building. There was interesting characters, even though the writing and the direction was so bad. Um, however, I think that the Phantom Menace actually looks really, really good when it's when you see the live action and you see the the real uh, locations that they went on to. Um, once he got past that and started relying on blue screen and green screen, that's when the films were just losing its, its kind of scope. Yeah, but I do agree like that game to me. Yeah. And, but there was a story a to be told. Of, yeah. And I'm also agreeing with you that the films should have started with a teenage uh, Anakin and, and, and seeing one, one, the bond and the friendship between Anakin and, Obi-Wan and then how that disintegrates 
And that would have been way more interesting than seeing the poor, uh, uh, what's his name? Jake, uh, Jake, Jake Lloyd. Lloyd. Jake poor, Lloyd. Yeah, I poor, mean, that guy, poor, that poor, poor kid, Jake Lloyd. He gets, man, it's not his fault. Um, no. So, but yeah, I agree with you on that. The story needed to be told in a different way, but I do appreciate the world building. Yeah. Hmm. I'd like to offer a counterpoint on the blue screen sort of things in that um, I feel that your brain is more likely to look at Camino and go, oh, that looks fake because you know it's fake. I've seen behind the scenes of a bit of Attack of the Clones and there are times when, um, you know, the scene where Anakin and Padme are on Naboo, you know, riding those creatures. Right. Some of the grass in the long shots is CGI, but you yeah. don't look at that grass and look at it and go, oh, that looks fake, that looks CGI, because your brain has an analog, it knows what grass looks like, it sees grass and it recognizes that's grass, okay, that's that's real, that's grass. But you don't have that, so say, Camino or Starship, so you're more naturally inclined to think it looks fake because you know it's fake yeah camino actually i thought was actually rather interesting and rather yeah, unique it was you. very um hubrickian actually with i'm, I'm talking more about when way. people say like bad cgi or yeah stuff the, like the bad cgi that. is the 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 rushed um droid factory thing oh, that geez, portman yeah. and like that that was added in afterwards like they felt they needed this and then of course the the horrible um c-3po cgi yeah he looked terrible and so when they start adding that sort of stuff in it's just, it's so, it's not engaging enough. And you can tell the actors are just acting to absolutely nothing. And they're getting nothing from the director as well. So, um, the Droid Factory scene and the Coruscant speeder chase in particular feel like video games. Um, yeah. Harrison's talking about grass, but all I'm thinking about when I see that movie is sand. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I get. I, I want to hear that your first pickup line, hey? How good uh, is that? I, you know what? I stole it from David Lee Roth. Hey, baby, I'm new in town. Can I get directions to your place? <laughs> anyway. Oh, I thought yeah. you were yeah. anything about, about bad glazed pickup donut. lines. What's that? I thought you would have said something about the glazed donut. Oh, but... that that would have been better. Um, and, and the last thing I wanted to say to, to Rob is uh, about Attack of the Clones. My actual least favorite piece of dialogue isn't the sand. It's I wish I could wish my feelings away. <laughs> I it, it, It's like, that's grade five. Yeah. They would tell you to substitute a different word for wish, you know? Uh, that and the absolutely horrendous fake laugh that uh, uh, Ewan, Ewan McGregor does in the in pretty much the opening scene in that <laughs> elevator. Oh, <the> elevator. <laughs> oh, yes, nervous. I, I was just, <laughs> I was like, Come on. Guys. The thing is, they, you know what's interesting? They told an interesting story there. Yes. Right? They're like, hey, do you remember that? Well, like, can we see that, please? No. <laughs> that no, that's been classic. Fun. That's classic Lucas world building. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, it's me next. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And I'm you. going with. Oh, sorry, Rob. No, no, no. You go ahead. Okay. Um, and I'm going with Solo. Boo. My Boo. 11. Dumb fun, but so terribly unnecessary. The naming of Han. The meeting of Chewie, all bad. I liked Woody and Donald Glover. They were terrific. Uh, Amelia Clark was uh, Amelia Clark. But visually, the movie was dark and muddy with... You, you couldn't see anything that was happening in, in that one planet battle that looked kind of cool. Um, Do you think Han could? What's that? Do you think, Do you think Han, Han could, could no. see anything? Um, but I did recently uh, listen to the soundtrack and mm. quite enjoyed the soundtrack, actually. Um I think I prefer that soundtrack to Rogue One, in fact. Um, and I like the the Rogue One. And I, I, I'm Powell. Powell is the name John of the composer. Powell yeah. solo, yes. Um, yeah, I, I quite enjoyed the soundtrack. But I, I find that movie just was completely unnecessary. And a lot of the stuff unfolded in ways that, you know, I'm not going to say contradict canon or anything like that because there wasn't really <laughs> anything established. Just a lot of legends but I think it contradicted a lot of stuff that in our heads we thought about the origin of Han Solo. Um, he was basically a slave, and I'm kind of sick and tired of that origin story. We already did that once. Um, you know, I always pictured Han Solo as somebody who had a falling out with his father and, you know, left home at the age of 13 or something like that. And I don't know, just that, and, and not that there's anything wrong with him having a first love before Leia, anybody would. 
of his age by the time he met Leia. Of course, he's probably had a couple loves since, you know, Kira. But uh, I don't know. It's just I, I had nothing invested in that because you know that's not that's not his his number one. That's not his one. Uh, I thought some of the stuff with the underworld was interesting, but eh, I. Oh shit, Paul Bettany. I love Paul Bettany, but damn, he did nothing for me in this movie. He really did nothing for me in this movie. And uh, you know, I love Ron Howard as well, but I, I don't think I, I not, none of this was his fault. It's nobody's fault in particular, as far as the directors go. It was a situation where they fired the first two guys and brought in Ron Howard to finish. And the, you know, you're usually going to get a dog's breakfast in that situation. Maybe the only one that might have not have been a dog's breakfast in the history of movies might have been Superman too, but that's up for debate. Um. Yeah, I'm sorry if I'm disappointing you guys by saying solo, but and I, I the thing is, coming. I watch solo frequently. I do because I sometimes want to be watching a Star Wars that has the Star Wars stuff that I like, but not have myself emotionally invested in watching it. And solo, <laughs> there you go. Fair. Yeah. Okay. Well out and fair. If there's nothing more to be said about Solo, then... Uh, there will be. There okay, will be. Okay, okay. There Good. will be. Uh, I'd like to uh, have a quick contest here. I want us to decide as a group which one of us looks the most like a Jedi. Holy God. Um, well, two of you have glasses, so... Oh, shit. I mean, which one of us looks the most like a Maybe Jedi? Maybe not a Jedi, but... Oh! <laughs> Hold on! Mike's got one of those. <laughs> I'll go get some of my stuff I wanted to show, but I alluded <laughs> to my sons, early. but he didn't want it, so <laughs> gave it to me. <laughs> so, Rob. <laughs> so, it's just us now. <laughs> hey, look at that. Nice. <laughs> uh, I get mine, but I the... absolutely love that thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's uh, my dog's scared of it, so we'll chase him around the house a few times with it. It's kind of um, funny. Sometimes after the show, Harrison asks me to run around in the yard with the lightsaber in the dark, just to, just for effect. That's actually a really good toy, to be honest with you. Yeah, I love that. It's you know, it's one of those ones where you can you can hit it. Yeah, it makes all the sounds. Make it's uh, it's pretty awesome. Yours looks more white than mine. Yeah, it uh, it does light up. No, I mean like it looks like it might have been bleached in the sun or something compared to mine. Um, yeah, yours yours is much much different. I don't know which one this is, but yeah. Anyway, yep. All right. So since I'm the most Jedi, <laughs> <laughs> well, see, you've been you 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 have been told that you look like Mark Hamill. Hmm. Yes, so I that's, have. That's been. not fair. Wow. I was in line at Mary Brown's Chicken when that happened. <laughs> True story. Okay, so Eric, you have recorded the first round. I have. Okay, Harrison, you're number ten. All right, you better have that eject button. For it. Sorry. You better have the boot from stream button at the. Ready. Oh yeah, yeah, I can do I'm that. Gonna be empire. It's gonna it is be empire. empire. You suck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is not a film that I have a burning dislike for in any way, unlike The Force Awakens. I just do not enjoy watching this film. Um, there are parts of it that I find boring. There are parts which I don't care for. And then there are parts like so much of the film is Han and Leia bickering, and I don't enjoy watching people bicker one, two, and I get enough bickering in real life, so no, no thank you. Um, there's no big climactic space battle, and I really like that in Star Wars films, especially because the two on either side of it have real good ones. I know it was trying to go for a slightly less grand take and stuff, but I don't agree with that. The Battle of Hoth is all right. It's pretty good, though. I do like the music that goes with that as well. The music I don't like has to be the asteroid field. That just makes a... I, it just annoys the hell out of me, that one. Yeah, um, yeah I agree. <laughs> That's it. Later. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Harrison. <laughs> Look what you've done. Look what you have done. 
I was supposed to unite the panel, not destroy them. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder how long they're going <laughs> to... Holy shit. This is never... Harrison, this has never happened before. <laughs> Look what you've done. A new, a new achievement. Wow. One piece of music, and you had to say it. You had to say it. God, it's just it's just the tone of it. It's just that sweeping thing at the tone. Oh, yeah. okay. okay, so Harrison, we're gonna right. move on from you. I will I, I will admit Become. that Become. The, Become. the Empire Strikes. His name back. is Harrison as well. Become. <laughs> Become. There is so it's it's only my favorite actor and my son's middle name. It's okay. Become. 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 There is something I will admit that there's a lot of Guy Zemitons. And that Rebel Flight uniform is probably my favorite piece of Star... One of my favorite pieces of Star Wars costume design ever. I love that flight uniform. It is, it is like a, one of the definitive flight suits in science fiction as far as yeah. I'm concerned. I love how the, each helmet's different. I love the orange, the, the bright orange with the subtle black accents and the gray accents. Yeah, I just really love that flight suit. It, so it lots of guys emitons in this film is a, a plus. Okay. Okay. Oh, speaking of guys, Emmetons, didn't you say you had a list from Catherine as well? Her list and my list are all but identical, except for the number one oh. and two spot. So, oh, look at that! <laughs> oh no, that's a great one. Look, I'm in okay, Rob is the Jedi. Rob is the Jedi. <laughs> nice. Where did you get that one? That's what I want to know. That's this similar to mine. Is, yeah, I'm just in a really. This is not um, great room. Star Wars. It is. Space sword, <laughs> but cost uh, you yeah. a dollar. Uh, actually, we're a little bit more than that, but yeah, that's cool, Rob. Okay, I'm giving you the Jedi now, title. Now, I, 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 I will say this: I am mature enough to take Harrison's, yeah, misguided um, opinion. And yes. continue on with the show. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Rob, for your professionalism tonight. You can I'm tell I'm gonna have to fix that hole here. in my wall. So but, um... <laughs> okay, Rob, redeem this show, please, for us. Oh, uh, Eric has already Oh sorry, no, Eric, Eric, please yeah. redeem so this show number for us. One is the Empire Strikes Back, and the asteroid field is the greatest piece of film music ever written. So long. All right, there you go. In a number 10. Mic uh, drop. Attack of the Clones. Yeah. Um, Rob said it already. Um, uh, the only thing that I will add is that there are two pretty entertaining set pieces uh, in this film. I do like the Coruscant chase. Um, it's fun. The only thing that I do hate about that is the music just gets absolutely butchered in it. But um, I, I find that it is a it's a traditional star Wars action set piece. And that's something that the rise of Skywalker doesn't have. So that's why attack of the clones is a little higher. And on top of that, I liked Obi-Wan and uh, Django Fett's fight. Um, I thought that was a lot of fun. Um, and then, I mean the, and then the other cool thing is that a brilliant new sound effect for those seismic charges. Yeah. Uh, really, really neat. Um, but we didn't need to see another asteroid field fight. Um, but besides that, uh, yeah, it's, it's a dull, boring, uninteresting film, a script where I think George Lucas thought he was trying to be Shakespeare and just wrote just the worst stuff I have ever heard. Um, he tried to be poetic and he's not a poet. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I, I don't want to see this film ever again and, but I would watch it over the rise of Skywalker any day of the week. Um, the only thing I will add to that is I wish I could wish that dialogue away. Yeah. <laughs> there was, I mean, there was such a, you could do something great with a, with a love story. He just needed a, I never a, bought a different that love story. script writer. I mean, I didn't, I didn't buy it, but I think that you needed somebody who was good at writing those type of stories. To Am I the only in. one who found it somewhat creepy when uh, Anakin's kind of like her guardian and he, he just has a really creepy look on his face and he's like, yes, oh yeah. Majesty. And he just looks like the stalker dude. Like you're expecting that this is 
in the next scene, he's going to be like hiding behind her door or something, you know, something really creepy. Like he was creepy, man. He was. Well, at the on, end of on, the day, this is the kid that turned into Darth Vader. Yeah, but I'll give, I'll give him that. I'll give him that. Yeah, because... I don't know. That, it just, he's he's just, just, even the anger, though, been... came Sorry. on just so quickly. There was nothing that developed that anger besides his mother, which, again, I thought that was a cheap shot. And, and, and that's not what should have turned him. Um, there should have been more exploration into that. Again, if you had got into the friendship of Obi-Wan and Anakin in the first one right away and then see how that turned, because that's the way I always felt. I felt yeah. that Obi-Wan did something wrong. Right. And, and, and that's the way I felt just based on those couple of lines of dialogue that um, Alec Guinness gave. I uh, thought I could train him as well as Yoda. I right. was wrong. Yeah. What and I can understand you could you still have that darkness with his with his mom and all that as the contributing factors, but we never saw him train him. We yeah. never saw that. Maybe Obi Wan is terrible at it, and that's why I like that new line in in the Obi Wan Kenobi uh, uh, trailer, trailer, where you know you like, you know you're going to train him the way you trained your you know his father. I'm like great yeah, line, but we never saw any of the training. Yeah. Yeah. What, what happened? You, right. To, right to use the vernacular of the young, that was a sick burn. That was a sick <laughs> I thought. Burn. <laughs> it was, and it's a great line. Oh, it's, it's a, a fantastic, fantastic line. line. Um, so yeah, Attack of the Clones just it's the title even is stupid too. So um yeah, it's just not good. It doesn't even have a good lightsaber battle. Um <laughs> because even the Yoda stuff is just brutal. It was all CG. So bad. Like yeah. I again, Yoda, I never expected Yoda to be the type of Jedi that would actually engage in a fight. Right. He would use his force power, but that that's all he would need to do. He'd like, you know, slowly crawl up and then just kick the shit out of anybody by just standing there. The I'm going to get, you know, all matrix these like, God, why? I'm going to address that in depth when I do my attack. Excellent. Response. Looking forward yeah. to it. Okay. Uh, just right. to briefly touch on lightsaber fights and the force power of the user. Um, this is going a bit off the beaten track, but if you know Darth Nihilus from Knights of the Republic 2, he has the power to consume life on a planetary scale, but oh. um, but your final fight with him just to, is a lightsaber fight. And the reason for that is the power he has is great and powerful, but it can't be wielded and directed like a weapon. It is a terrible thing. And that's the explanation because he has all this power, but at the end of the day, it's on a planetary scale. He can't direct it at your character, so you just hit each other with swords. And I think that's a good explanation for why some lightsaber fights do devolve into, or sorry, some conflicts just devolve into whacking lightsabers at each other. Yeah, I always got the feeling, especially after Luke on Dagobah, that using the Force, even Yoda, like there was some exactly. sense of concentration and it would just yeah. drain you. So you wouldn't use it all the time. And that's why you had to have hand-to-hand -hand combat but yoda and duker are just like throwing light bolts at each other and rocks and stuff it it, it just takes the the mysticism of the yeah. of the power and the religion and just throws it out the door as if and again i mean with ray being a, a you know a force uh sensitive person right away it just i mean the the, the force doesn't matter anymore and that's yeah. where i it started to um decay once we got into the prequels because it was just overused i think two of you guys will understand this reference <laughs> yeah. i like the one with darth vader plays with his dolls come on eric you know i i i know i know i know Bob what he's does. referring to we did a show on this one together oh yes, my god did. i'm i missed the i miss it i'm, I'm drawing a blank dark helmet Dark <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> anyway, where do right. we see Colonel Rob? Sanders? Yeah. Chicken. Oh, you got it. <laughs> All right. This has been mentioned. Um, the only reason why it is higher than the rest of you guys is uh, it was the last movie that I saw in the theater with Dorothea. And that's the only reason why. It is a film with missed opportunities abundant. Um, the fact that they couldn't bring the characters in live action for that scene where Ray is, is on her back and looking up and they're all talking to her. Well, we don't see them. We hear them and everybody's going, who's, who's that voice? Who's that voice? Who's that? I was sitting in the theater and people are going, 
who's who is that? Who is that? If you had seen them, it would have made more sense. Oh, it would have been powerful. It would have been absolutely amazing. Could you imagine the shot just like on her eyes and then it's slowly pulling out, right? Revealing her entire body. Then all of a sudden the yeah. the force ghosts start repairing yeah. and just to get into this Could you giant imagine wide just... shot. Could you so imagine Anakin just staring straight at Palpatine? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I thought that. I thought that the the movie had so many missed opportunities. The entire sequel trilogy is full of missed opportunities. Um, I like the fact that they brought Wedge back for that one shot. Mm -hmm. Nice shooting, um, Lando. And. Or nice flying Ky Lando. Kylo like. Ren, I have to admit, is the only character throughout mm -hmm. the entire series that is a that actually has a an, a decent story arc and is a complex character. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what the hell was up with that kiss at the end? Like, what? Where did that come from? This from felt fans. like a film made by a committee. Yes. Well, it was. As Leia said, I am not a committee. But in any case, um, yeah, it felt like control was taken out of Abrams' hands and it was turned over to uh, Catherine Kennedy and her, 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 her Lucas film flunkies and that sort of thing. And it was, it was basically they uh, the the producers sitting back and reading all the tweets that people made about the uh the last jedi going well maybe we shouldn't maybe we should add this and this and this and this it should have if anything it should have been a two part film cuz they crammed so much shit into that bag that uh it it could not hold it <laughs> and it was it still paced lightning fast <laughs> yes exactly and uh i i'm like I said, the only reason why it's higher than than Attack of the Clones is it is the last film, and I do hold that very close to my heart. I have a question. Yes. What was the reaction in your theater for the moment that J.J. Abrams tried to do an Avengers portal scene in Star Wars where Lando and a million ships show up and one of the cheesiest renditions of the Star Wars main theme erupts and we're all supposed to be like yes like the portal scene in Avengers yeah. Endgame my theater were in hysterics the laughing was unreal and I sank in my seat because I was embarrassed for the movie at that part because I knew what they were trying to do and failed miserably at it. And they double down on Endgame later with an I am all the Jedi. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I recall the theater being absolutely silent Yeah, when that happened. No cheers, no mm. um, this is a cool scene kind of thing. It was like, I think I, I, think I heard somebody say, didn't they do this in an Avengers movie? <laughs> they did. <laughs> And I'm like, mm, you're kind of right, but yeah, that's that's how the re that's how the reaction I remember. Um, funny, there are people who have like looked at the ships and the models and like gone into detail about some of the ones that are there. And there's some like transport freighters with no guns. There's like this <laughs> one ship from like four thousand plus years ago that's somehow still alive, and like they've gone into all the useless ships in the battle. That wouldn't have I'm done surprised there wasn't I, a I shoe and a potato that. in there. What that? I mean, the, Sorry, I'm, I'm surprised there wasn't a shoe and a potato in there. <laughs> there probably was. I like well, it know, how in the new Lego Star Wars game, part one of the things in there is an Ewok on a glider. That's funny. <laughs> I like that. That probably happened. You know what's funny <laughs> though is like I'm I'm invested in Star Wars. I mean, I'm not a huge huge fan. I actually dislike most of the movies compared to um, you know liking them, but. I have no real emotional interest in the MCU. I mean, I like some of the movies, but I'm not like a comic book nerd. I'm not invested in the characters. I like some of the movies. But when I saw Endgame 
I was blown out of my seat at that portals moment. When that oh, happened, yeah. I had goosebumps. I was freaking out. I knew why they were doing it, but it was the best kind of fan service because the buildup was worth it. It was earned. Yeah. And then when you see it in Rise of Skywalker, none of that is earned. And it's just flat and boring. And as I said, embarrassing. And yeah. I hate that stuff. I really do. Um, and again, that's what, another reason why I just Rise is so poorly made. That's the thing. It's so poor. A lot of people work very, very hard on that movie. And it's just an absolute turd. And I feel sorry for the people that worked on it. I really do. Yeah. And just to sort of cap off this general sequel discussion, um, John Williams is a god, but boy, did he drop the ball on the sequels. There are three memorable themes across the three movies, and they all came out of Force Awakens. You know what? You're not wrong. Yeah. You're, You're not, not wrong. You're not. I don't even, I can't, I can't even sing the main two main themes from Rise of Skywalker right now. No, I can't. Can I. Um, and I hate Rose's theme with a passion. Um, but you're right. The, I mean, if you want to talk to scores, I mean, John Williams, I feel like when John Williams wrote the score for the force awakens, I don't think he knew he was going to come back for the other two. I think he just says, I'm going to throw everything at this. This is my last hurrah. Yeah. And he wrote a score that is on par with the original trilogy, the plethora of new themes, the reuse of, of the old themes. It was smart. It was fun. It was interesting. That end credit suite is one of the best things he's ever done. And then it's just like almost flatline oh, for the other flat. two. Yeah. And and there's reasons behind that. Um, but anyway, but yeah, Force Awakens is a is an absolutely incredible score. All right. I'm gonna take it to number my number 10. And unfortunately, we're gonna have to pick up the pace because it's already quarter to eight. <laughs> <laughs> We've only done two we're rounds. Have to do a part two. <laughs> well, as we get to duplicate picks, we'll have less yeah, and less we'll to have say. Less to yeah. say. But uh, I'm going to go hard on The Phantom Menace for my number 10. Um, like I said, just watch a bit of it now. Uh, I wrote down some notes here. Captain Panaka's line about facing a battle-hardened Federation army. Battle-hardened? They're fucking droids, you jackass. <laughs> Actually, what I wrote down was they're droids, you fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Pissed me off that Yoda was not Obi-Wan's master. Or are we just going to retcon that line in The Empire Strikes Back? Maybe he should have said, there you will learn from Yoda, a Jedi Master who instructed me, not the Jedi Master that instructed me. That proves to me that George Lucas never had a plan. No. He never had a plan. No. He just decided, you know what? I can't have Yoda be his master. I got to have this. We got to have Liam Neeson be his master. We just have to. And then the last note I made was when Jar Jar... To be fair, the... sorry to interrupt. To be fair, Obi-Wan's lied or at a certain point of view to look oh, before. Oh, bullshit. Does he really want to get into, oh, I had this master, but he died because he wasn't very good. You know, yeah, blah, blah, blah. No, <laughs> Simplify no, things. He should have just said, a Jedi master who instructed me. That's, that's a retcon, and I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it anymore. And this is jumping ahead. I don't like it any more than Leia remembering her mother that she should have no memory of. Anyway. The last that came note, before the. No, oh, actually, sorry, yeah. That, the last that, note that I could made be an ex was, explanation behind that. We can talk about that later. Okay, I don't like it though. Yeah. <laughs> My last note that I made was when Jar Jar entered the screen, and I just said, "Fuck, it's so bad." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I read a lot of defense for this film recently uh, about the world building, which Eric mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of ingenuity. I mean, they they found a new way of making movies. Um, creativity was off the charts. Especially, I really loved the Naboo designs. Uh, Darth Maul was, aside from dying like a bitch really early, you know, too too soon in this trilogy, Darth Maul was great. Duel of the Fates remains one of John Williams' finest achievements, period. Uh, but some of the acting might as well have been done by a modern-day speech synthesizer program. And there are some really, really, really terrible characters like Jar Jar Binks, Boss Nass, and Watto. Um there was a dumb cameo by Jabba the Hutt that made no sense. Um, they've since tried to, you know, make the Jabba character more of a, you know, almost like the mayor of a town. Uh, when, you know, when we saw Return of the Jedi, that isn't what we thought of Jabba the Hutt. Anyway, um, when I first saw The Phantom Menace, like everybody else, I thought it was the greatest thing ever. But <laughs> watching it over again... I mean, there's stuff I like about it. Don't get me wrong. I think the the uh, Naboo battle at the end is one of the best battles in Star Wars. Um, I don't think the space battle's that good. 
And no. I, I think I think the pod pod race is, is a novelty that was kind of fun uh, because we had the CG ability to do a pod race, but it served no other purpose except for George Lucas. It's like George Lucas getting out his dinky cars going, eh, 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 you know. You know, I, I was actually going to be a little more harsher and say that's Lucas masturbating all over the screen with his with his graphics. I almost said that, Rob. Thank you. I think <laughs> at only, the end of the day, Star Wars is what George Lucas says it. If, if if he wants to make it that way, if he wants that, if that's what he wants it to be, at the end of the day, there's only so much you can. Hey, sure. Arthur, like, I'm biting my tongue right now. I'm biting my tongue, and the reason I'm biting my tongue right now is I had a conversation with myself earlier. And I remember seeing this film in the theater and saying to my sister, you know, that Jar Jar, you know, but that's George's vision. That's George's vision. This is the first chapter of a trilogy. We're going to see how it goes. And, you know, stuff like Roger, Roger. But you know what? That's what George wanted. That's how George wanted it to be. That's his vision. Yeah. And, I, and I no longer think <laughs> getting out of his teeth. <laughs> hey, Carl. Yes, that's what George was doing. Anyway, well, you forgot one word though that just completely ruins everything. Yippee! Oh, Yippee. That too. <laughs> yeah. it so um, it's midi chlorins. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. And you know what? Enough said. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, uh, the only thing I'll say about midi chlorines is what I don't like about it is that in, it almost introduced like a video game type leveling of Jedi. Like, I have 1,000 midi chlorines. Right. How many does Darth Vader have? Well, he's got 5,000. Well, yeah. that means he's five times stronger than this guy who's only got 1,000, you know? It's uh, over 9,000. Sorry. Anyway, yeah. uh, let's pick up. Anybody get that reference? Yeah. No, I, I didn't. Let's yeah. pick up the pace a bit. Um, right. Harrison, yeah. put it in Darth, light speed with your Darth Maul is the Boba Fett of the prequels. The, uh, yeah. I'm of the opinion that the only reason people like him is because he had a double lightsaber and a hit single as a theme song. <laughs> no, there's more to it than that. There's more to it than that. The, the cool speaking voice by Peter Serenapovitz. Sir, Sir, Sir <laughs> <laughs> speaking voice. <laughs> He's a badass clothes. Uh -oh. Cool facial tattoos. Good horns on his head. That's the line. Of Everything Darth Maul did, Savage Press did better, basically, in my opinion. Oh, the voice... God. The tattoos, the colors. Anyway, I'll get on. Okay, um, number also, nine. with the uh, original trilogy, I was going to also specify which version of the film I like for extra contrarian points. So I'll go I back to too. Empire Strikes Back and say special edition. You need that Emperor change, the, the update. Oh, my God. I did that too. Anyway, getting to number nine. Um, I'm going to get cancelled again. Rogue One. Oh, it no, just I'm good with that. bored me to death. I, just, I didn't care for any of these characters. They were so boring. The character that I sympathized with most was Director Krennic because nothing was going his way. Tarkin's <laughs> trying to steal his weapon out from under him. He's got he problems here. Yep, he, fucking, Gaila, he, had, he fucking blew up the base with Krennic. Yeah, he ends up getting killed by his own weapon. Everything's going his against him. His own boss using his own weapon. Emperor. It's, like, it's yeah. almost like Donald Trump saying, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor Krennic. Like, I didn't care about anyone else. It did admittedly have one of the best space battles in the franchise. I really liked that Battle of Scarif. And it also showed off the power of air-to-surface covering fire and that, like, which is something that not many Star Wars battles have shown us. Like, just seeing the X-Wings take out the AT-ATs like nothing and help the ground force like that was something great too. And I will admit that it has great cinematography, probably the best of the entire saga in my opinion, but God, it just bored me so much. Boring characters, boring things happening that wasn't that space battle. Even the Darth Vader Hall scene, I don't like as much because it goes against my interpretation of the Force being like, Vader doesn't need a line of sight to know that the Death Star plans are there. He's got the Force. He's, you know, he, he, he aware of everything around him. He just has to snap his fingers and boom, plans go bye-bye. But no, they want for like some dramatic, like he has to get through every single little rebel first. He could have force crushed the, the plans. Like Literally, that. yeah. Yeah. He can breathe um, in space, you know. He doesn't need to go through them one by one, letting them get the plans away, you know. Yeah, all right. I, uh, so I think I think instead of everybody doing a rebuttal, which I've been enjoying, <laughs> we should save them for when we all do Rogue One. Just Agreed. for the interest of time. Because I I I 
do have to make dinner for my wife tonight. <laughs> anyway, Eric Woods, Mace Woodsu, number nine. <clears throat> uh, number nine is The Last Jedi. Um, it's, yeah, just The Last Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, <laughs> you know what he reminds me of like in wayne's world hi we're in delaware yeah it's it, there's the, the laundry list of things that i just can't stand in this movie is so long but i do appreciate what ryan johnson was trying to do i think the execution is piss poor I think that there were ideas and even shocking scenes in there that could have really hit hard, but then were just, again, much like Rise of Skywalker, completely retconned after a few seconds. Leia's death, when she gets sucked out into space, I thought, that's how it's going to go? And I'm like, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. But then you got her Mary Poppins her way back into the friggin' ship, and it's just like it's ludicrous. That that and was then disappointing. The whole Holdo uh um Poe thing. I I the, the, the pilots are all rebels, they're all like hotheads. That's what they're like. And by the way, Poe saved the freaking day. Come on. Mm. So that whole interactive oh and and, and the, the boring lobs of curving laser fire for half that movie that's your action sequence for the middle portion of the scene or the film then you go to canto bite blight yes. canto sucks which is it makes no sense it doesn't mean anything um i know what they're again they're trying to do when they leave and i like that idea that you have these underground sellers that are selling weapons to both the rebels and the bad guys that's a really interesting concept that should have been developed even more in a right. different way. So just the execution of this movie really bothered the hell out of me. Having said that, I want to say something positive. And as much as the, the light speed attack uh, thing that happened in the middle with Holdo's maneuver, there are some incredible editing between the three different scenes that are happening. And that is all brought together by an incredible cue written by John Williams. And he is matching every single emotional beat for every single scene change. And one of my favorite moments is when Kylo and Ray are fighting for that lightsaber and they basically force each other and blow themselves back. And Williams just hits it with like this timpani bass uh, symbol hit and it just changes the the key and the dr the dramatics of the scene, the way it builds up to the, the to the light speed maneuver. Um, that was some excellent filmmaking, but the rest of it just felt pointless. The um, again, I was hating the movie, but then um, uh, what's his face? Finn was going to sacrifice himself, and I'm like, oh, that's how he's going to go. Fantastic. <laughs> There's some genuine drama. He's going to go. And this is only sort of like what Harrison Ford wanted in The Empire Strikes Back. You know, yeah. Finn has really nothing to do. So let's have him sacrifice himself. And then the dumbest thing in the entire world happens after that. We've all seen the movie. It's just so stupid. Um, a lot of it is stupid. Um, but uh, it's stupid. The yeah. Last Jedi. <laughs> I will just quickly say that the only reason you know that Canto Bite doesn't matter is because you've seen the movie and you know that it doesn't matter in the end. The characters don't know that. That's not a defense. No, it's yes, bad it filmmaking. Is. It yeah. might be a story point and a plot point for the characters, but it's just bad storytelling because it's meaningless for the film. The film is boring. The film is worse because of that. They try. The part, that's the biggest problem also is they've separated the characters that should be together yeah. and bonding. Yeah. And we're not getting that because, you know, they've established some sort of friendship in the first movie. Now let's get them together and let's see what they're going to do together. And they right. just separated them again. And like the fact that Ray and Poe meet for the first time at the end of the last Jedi is really kind of fucked. Holy crap. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh at the very end of the God. movie. Hi, I'm Ray. Right. I'm Poe. Or, or, or she says, I'm Ray. And he says, I know, or something oh like that. My God. Anyway, yeah. let's move on to Rob's number nine. Yeah. All right. I'm going to be very, very brief on this one. We've already discussed this one. Um, I know what it is, then. but I will have to say that my opinion changed greatly after the Plinkett review. 
<laughs> we'll say that. And that's Phantom Menace. Um, I was originally, and I am on record, by the way, back in ni- back in ninety nine. I actually was on a show on on a on a morning talk show where I I I kind of sort of defended um Phantom Menace, but now I'm like again, I've softened a bit on the whole original, but I just have one word for you and that's midichlorians. And that <laughs> uh, and that has always bothered the hell out of me. In fact, I think yeah. at my 40th birthday I ha- I had I had uh, a f- couple of friends over and I said one thing ruined the, the Phantom Menace for me and I said one word midichlorians after that party was over I have never heard from that friend again <laughs> oh my god good so, riddance, I guess wow. so something he he, he either uh, just really disagreed with me or whatever in any case midichlorians worst thing that had ever been added to to the Star Wars lore Yep, and um, yeah, that's my number nine. And the only thing I'm going to add to that because I didn't get to this earlier, uh, thank God George Lucas didn't make his midi chlorian based sequel trilogy. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Oh um, man, my number nine is Rob's favorite movie, Attack of the Clones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wrote that it's an interesting attempt to change the pace, but the acting was still wooden, perhaps even more wooden than it was in the Phantom Menace. I don't blame Hayden Christensen. I believe it was the director. We know what his style is. We know that he's on record as using inferior takes, in my opinion. I thought the Yoda fight was dumb. You guys might remember the old PC Star Wars chess video game. And I believe Yoda might have been a rook. He was one of the most powerful characters. I remember that. Possibly, I think probably a rook. But the interesting thing was... In video chess, you know, the characters fight. It's kind of, it's fun to watch, right? It's still chess. You, the One beats the other, but you get to watch them fight. And Yoda's character never used a lightsaber. This is pre-prequels. This is early 90s. He used the force to trick his opponents. So, like, for example, he might make a stormtrooper shoot himself in the foot. Or make himself appear here, and then here, and then here, and then here, and confuse his opponent. But he only used the force for defense, never for attack, which was what we were told. <laughs> as far as the Phantom Menace goes, you know, they threw everything, or not the Phantom Menace, sorry, Attack of the Clones. They threw everything against the wall. And I'm talking about especially that Yoda Dooku fight where it's just like a ball of, it's like the Tasmanian devil with a lightsaber. And to George Lucas, I would say this I would quote the president of the United Federation of Planets when I say, just because you can do a thing, it does not follow that you must do that thing. That's all I have to say about that. I've got another quote. I was going to save it for my Phantom Menace uh, reveal, but the best quote that George Lucas ever said, and he just completely went, (laughs) went against it, was a special effect is a tool, a means of telling a story. A special effect without a story is a pretty boring thing. So what happened? How did he, he forget forgot. that? He forgot everything. Yeah, I think he just had too many, you know, too many toys to play with. And not enough and not enough people telling him no. That's the problem. Rick McCallum, Rick McCallum. was a terrible producer. It's always yep. a problem with Rick's. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's that round. Harrison, your number eight. The rise of Skywalker. It's very messy. But it does some things right. It gives us the Knights of Ren. It gives us the three leads on screen together for the first yeah, time. time. That's great. They they do well there. I like that. It gives us Wedge and Lando. And it gives us new lightsaber colors like the Yellow Saber. But it's all just too little, too late. The three leads shouldn't have happened now. The Knights of Ren should have been earlier. The first thing I asked when I walked out of the cinemas in 2015 is, where the hell is Wedge and Lando? Yeah, and yeah. the yellow saber. Of, okay, yeah. yeah. Palpatine's admittedly fun in this one because you know he's Palpatine. You know, Ian McDermott is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Like I'm not as hard on it because I put put the blame for the sequel trilogy entirely on the Force Awakens. So yeah, that's why this one's a little higher. But it it's admittedly fun, even if 
there are bits which I go, yeah, I wish that wasn't in there. Cool. Thank you, Harrison. Eric Woods. Okay. My number eight. Oh, yeah. Okay. What's the Phantom Menace? Um, I think everything that's been said so far, I don't think I have anything left to add. Um, yeah. I mean, I like, uh, I like the, I like the production design. I love the ship design. I love the fact that this is, um, it seems like it's like f really fifties inspired, you know, clean, mm. smooth chrome edges or uh, sides. And, and just the, the interesting ship design compared to that kind of rugged lived in, um, look that we had in star Wars. Mm. So I thought that was fascinating, but it's just a, it's it's Lucas just throwing everything in it and hoping that it sticks and Jar Jar's a bad idea. Um, the the CGI wasn't up to snuff. It just wasn't there. It, it wasn't working yet. Um, and he relied on it way too uh, heavily. Um, I did like the well, no, actually, I didn't. I hated the puppet Yoda, but I'm glad there was a puppet Yoda. And I hated the fact that they replaced him with a CGI Yoda. Um, so yeah, but it, it, Darth Maul probably should have stuck around. Um, he probably should have been a much more interesting character, maybe in the second films. But I, I think that was a a waste because there was then a like Obi Wan had someone that he, uh, you know, he can actually go against. There was there was vengeance there that again could have lured him to the dark side because he killed his master. Because uh, you know Maul right. killed his master. That could have been an interesting plot point, but killing him was a bad idea. And so, yeah, it's just a clumsy film, but I, I did watch it recently and, you know, I can skip to the good parts and there's more good parts in this movie than the other films that I've uh, listed. And I really do appreciate the, um, the uh, pod race. And the point of that was to showcase Anakin's skill as a pilot. And, um, so I appreciated that. And I think it's actually a great star Wars set piece. Again, those set pieces like the battle of Hoth or the Yavin battle, those long set pieces. And I, I felt invested in it. Yeah. Um, and I thought that, oh, and the sound design, unbelievable, yeah. Yeah. really, really well done. I mean, that's one thing you could say about all these movies. The sound is great for the most part. Now, Ben so, Burt only did the first six, right? I think he did seven. I could really? no. I think he, he was either a consultant. I think he might have helped out with episode seven, but you can just tell that they were monkeying around with it because blasters weren't sounding the same in uh, like the um, the guns on the Millennium Falcon. Right? They they had a different sound. Um, mm -hmm. Those cannons made a different sound. I don't know. Anyway, I think Bert was involved maybe on seven, but I could be wrong. Uh, anyway, anyway they all sound great. I wanted to make Star sure that his name got out there tonight. Star Wars tends to reuse a lot of sounds. True. Like the curiously, like the, the scream from the uh oh yeah. The yeah. spider creature, the Acklay in Attack of the Clones is reused for the Gamorrean guards falling off the cliff in Boba Fett. Oh, is it? I didn't realize that. Don't get me started on Boba Fett. No, let's not go there. Book of Boba Fett. Yeah. Okay, Rob, let's do your number eight. My number eight. Um I don't know if this has been mentioned yet, um, but uh, my number eight is Revenge of the Sith. Has not come up yet. Well, they've um, all been mentioned on mates, but... You know. For right, me, but... Uh, again, not a... This is where it should have began, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. Um, they pushed the PG rating to a PG-13, which I thought was okay, but... Um, Again, it falls onto Lucas's wooden dialogue and having to spell everything out. You're you're breaking my heart, Anakin. Like no no shit, really. He's turning to the dark side. You're the, so so beautiful. Exactly. This is the. <laughs> Are you saying well, that love it, is blind? That, that, that exchange that exchange with Padme. It's, uh oh, and it, <laughs> it's like they just met for the first time. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, you know what? I got to be honest with you. I have sometimes thought that Jen and I talked the same way that Anakin and Padme have talked in Revenge of the Sith. 
honestly, we're we're that goofy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and again, I have softened on the prequels significantly, but still, I have to say that my number eight, uh, Revenge of the Sith. I will say this: I felt that John Williams. You you said that John Williams was throwing everything in the kitchen sink with uh, Force Awakens. I think he was doing that and more with Revenge of the Sith. If you listen to that last cue, uh, what is it? Uh, A New Hope. Um, and it's like 13 minutes long. It's like, holy crap. Just everything is in there. Well, it was supposed to be the last hurrah. And well, yeah. And, and I'll get into that in, in when I get into uh, when I hit Force Awakens. But yeah, that's my number eight. Uh, Revenge of the Sith. Okay. I'm going to do my number eight. And oh, then sorry. Wanna... And one more thing. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Pod race went on too long. Mm-hmm. Especially if you watch it on the DVD with the fourth lap. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do no- my number eight. And then I'm going to take a quick break to check in on Jen. Uh, my number eight is, I think the first time this film has come up tonight, Rogue One. No, I no, no. You, yeah. Okay. Nine. That's right. That's right. How could I forget? Um, I characterize Trace. Rogue One as AKA. The opening credits to A New Hope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I wrote that the droid was good. Entertaining, you know. Yeah. Filled that C-3PO role. Krennic was excellent. Um, mm. Remind me what the actor's name is. Ben Mendelsohn. Ben Mendelsohn. Australian I'm so fellow. glad that I have discovered Ben Mendelsohn. I really like him. Really, really like him. I'm shocked that you would know that, uh, Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> he was in uh, Captain Marvel, too. Yes, and, and, uh, and Spider-Man. Uh, far from home. Oh, yes. uh, I felt that the Vader stuff in, in this movie was forced. It wasn't necessary. Um, I did like the archival footage that they used of Gold Leader, etc. Mm. during that space battle. That Red Leader. Talked about. thought that was cool. Uh, it was noticeable, but it was still pretty cool. Uh, it basically, my bottom line with Rogue One is this is not how the Death Star plans were stolen in my when I played Star Wars with my action figures as a kid, you know, it, 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 it's a way that the Death Star plans could have been stolen. Not the way I really saw it happening, but, you know, whatever. That's that's personal canon. That's head canon. And it doesn't really count for anything. Um, you have the same problem with Revenge of the Sith, which we'll get to. But, you know, when you're a young fellow or, or young girl, in my sister's case, you know, you have ideas in your head of how this might have gone down. And no matter what you do, when you put it on the screen, you're going to be disappointed. It's impossible to take what every single child in their head has individually and somehow amalgamate it and put it on the screen and say, here's here's the story. Um, I like Rogue One from the perspective of here's a movie set in the Imperial era. We get to see what it's like living in the Empire because this is something we never really saw in the original trilogy. We know what it was like to live in the Republic. It sucked if you're out in the frontier. It's not so bad if you're sitting there pretty in your Coruscant apartment looking at the cars going by. Um, so it's kind of neat to see, you know, being stopped for your identification. Oh, yeah, just, just a moment. I got to find my gloves, you know. Um, but like Harrison said, you're not invested in the characters. You know, they're all dead at the end of the movie. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I like watching Rogue One in the same way that I like watching Solo. When I'm in the mood for something Star Wars-y, but I don't want to be emotionally invested in the Skywalker saga. So I throw on Rogue One, I have a rip-roaring good time, and I complain that for some reason on Jedha, there's the two characters that uh, on Family Guy were dubbed Pig Nose and his friend Scott. (laughs) <laughs> which would be Walrus Man and Dr. Evazad. They would have had to have gotten out of there very shortly after that. Right, happened. like they must have been on the next transport to Tatooine, right? But, uh, you know, stuff like that pisses me off. And also, you know, I should also say this as one last commentary on Rogue One. I realize that the Empire is a big, big place, but I hate seeing a dozen new Stormtrooper designs and a dozen new TIE Fighter designs and new Walker Sequels designs that in all of them... What's that, Harrison? The sequels took that up to 11. That's allowed, though. We're hmm. Now we're going back in time to a right. period where we've seen lots and lots of action, and here's a bunch of TIE fighters we've never seen before. Here's a bunch of stormtroopers sure. we've never seen before. Why haven't we seen them before? Anyway, that's my last rant on Rogue One. 
to add a quick addendum to what I've seen, even though Rogue One largely bored me, it did improve a lot of A New Hope when I watched it. You know, there were great more, it is fun. It, it, felt... it is an enhancement movie. Yeah. If you watch it in the right mindset and watch them in order, it's an enhancement movie. I do agree. Though admittedly, it does make that final medal ceremony a bit shallow, knowing that there are half a dozen other people that deserve that as much as Luke and uh, Han do. Right, right. Okay, so let's take a break. Uh, we are going to play a song while I do a gen check, and you guys can take a coffee break or whatever. We are going to play... Just looking for one with the right length of time. We are going to play Community here on the LeBrain Train. We'll see you in four minutes and 14 seconds.
desde Cuba a la comunidad de Aaron. Hello, young cop. How are you today? Um, largely well. I'm not liking the amount of prequel bashing going on, but I think I'm giving as good as I'm getting. I, you know what? I'm going to say, I think we're being fair. I think we, we're, we're telling you why we hate it, but I think we're also letting you know that there are, there are things that we do like about them. Um, I like, but, and I, and I like that about this conversation and I, and I also appreciate your, um, your feedback as well from like, I might not agree, but you're making good points here. Yeah. So, everybody's made good points. With like the nothing. exception of your opinion on the asteroid field. Right. Other rubbish. <laughs> That's, I mean, I didn't boot you off, but I could have, I just wanted to show you guys my, uh, Darth Vader hyper real figure. You'll notice it has no joints. Oh. It has a metal skeleton underneath sort of like a plastic rubber suit. So he actually has no joints anywhere on the figure. Wow, that's which interesting. Which is kind of neat. Um, there's only two of these. There's Vader and there's Luke. And uh, they're 100 bucks each, so I find them a little bit overpriced mm. for a 10-inch wow. figure. But, hey, I bought Vader because... It's Vader. Yeah. Look at that. I mean, it is a... Uh, as far as like an actual Vader figure goes that I own... This is the most beautiful one. So, yeah. Okay, so we're on the number seven. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Oh, look at what's up. Now, I'm missing the breastplate. I don't know. I got this from a friend in the United States, and he had this uh, online um, soundtrack streaming station, and he uh, owns a, a toy shop. So he just sent my kids a whole bunch of stuff. Well, Liam didn't want this. And so, but I lost the breastplate, so I don't know where that is. But the coolest thing about this is it actually made cool. The mask and now. where is it? The lightsaber lights up. But I don't know how to do that. <laughs> that is pretty cool. Um, yeah, he gave me this in a, in a stormtrooper from uh, from the Rise of Skywalker with the, the jetpack. Um. But this is really neat. Yeah, I just wish I had the breastplate. Oh, and of course, the helmet comes off. Ah, and cool. And it's Anakin. There's Anakin. So it's That's pretty. Cool. So like when it goes when it goes back on his head, it makes that sound um, from from Revenge of the Sith. Yeah. Anyway, right on. I wish I could find the lightsaber have... button. Oh, there it is. Neat. Anyway, yeah. I have something similar in, but it's in storage. Unfortunately, it's from like the early two thousands. It's probably the equivalent of like a Hot Toys Vader now, but it's just Vader's body without his helmet, and his right hand has been removed as per the feature, and it's got like the stub of wire. And that's just oh, wow. because somebody found that at a flea market and just brought it. And that was probably the first thing I ever saw in Star Wars. But just before I get to my entry, just quickly, some stuff that basically we were talking earlier about origins. Um, how I know that I would have been six by the time I'd seen all six is because I have this very beat up from 2005. Cool. And I got this for my birthday in 2006. And it's from before Avenger the Sith. There's a lot of behind the scenes for Avenger the Sith, but there's also a lot of behind the scenes, including set photos for A New Hope. It's black and white stuff. It's just sort of like, a good look at the expanded universe, the films and everything. It's a really, and just, it's basically sort of like covers everything about Star Wars. It also has this picture of Freddie Mercury. <laughs> because there's that scene or that line in Bicycle mm. Race. Jaws was never my scene and I don't like Star Wars. <laughs> and something else is um, my love of Star Wars was so well known that by the time grade three came around, people, other kids in my class would just give me old Star Wars stuff, just leave it at my desk for me. I have like the significant part of a Republic gunship play set that somebody just gave to me in a bag. And I also have this from 1986. It's quite beat up as well, but it was oh, given to me. Man. Yeah, it's, it's annoying because it, it looks like a four, but it opens up and it's like that. Wow. Okay. And it's got just some concept art pictures from the thing, but it's from 1986, so it's cool. And that is cool. All right. Anyway, let's try oh, to rip through yes. these. 
Um, number seven, A New Hope. This isn't due in part to a deficiency in A New Hope. It's a fun, good film, but it's just Star Wars. It's not the one with Jango Fett and Count Dooku. It's not the one with the battle in the lava, the battle of Coruscant. It's not the one with, you know, the battle of Endor. It's just Star Wars. And for some people, that's good enough. You know, when I'm sitting down to watch it, that's good enough for me. I don't wish I was watching another one. I enjoy it. But at the end of the day, it's not one that I go to very often because it's just Star Wars. But something I really like about Lucas's style of world building is he'll just, characters will talk to talk about things that they would have known well that the audience doesn't know and they'll just talk to it like they've talked about it all the time like the two examples in a new hope are the spice mines of kessel and the clone wars they just name dropped not explained and it really helps the world feel real and lived in rather than having them explain to the audience what it is and um surprisingly my preferred version of a new hope is the original or as close as you can come i think the cgi advancements of the special edition did not offset the two terrible additional well the one terrible additional scene and han not shooting first the terrible additional scene that that you know i I, like i said i'm doing the same thing as you i'm telling which versions i like i think we're 100 percent in agreement on all of this stuff when it comes to which versions yeah Yeah, that scene with sorry that scene with jabba is terrible. It's a, basically a butchering of Jabba's character because yep. one, he's the crime boss. He doesn't Step go to the tail. he sends his flunkies. Two, Jabba the Hutt, the most powerful crime boss in Tatooine, does not just saunter out among the public to the Millennium Falcon where an assassination attempt I think, could happen. <laughs> no, right. I, I think it would just ruined, well, not ruined the character of Jabba, but it really dumbed him down more than he had to. It, it ruined his mystery for anybody mm. who has never yeah. seen it before. The best thing was, you're right, you know, everybody knows who Jabba the Hutt is, and he's this dangerous gangster. And then all of a sudden, you see him in Jedi, and you're like, this is the most powerful gangster in the universe? Yeah. That's impressive for a guy just on a slab who really can't move is ruling this planet. I loved that. I just loved every bit of that. And just, he could do anything, but I mean, anybody could assassinate him at any time, but yeah. nobody does. He's respected. And he looks like that. And and he I looks like that. that. And the fact that he's moving around and all the other movies, it's like, no, he should be crippled. He should just be sitting there eating his frogs and watching the ladies <laughs> dance and killing people with the rancor and ruling the galaxy from his slab. I loved that. And you're right. It was ruined in that scene. I understand why it's there. I just think it should just mm. be a deleted scene and you could play it on the DVD. But it was enticing when you saw the trailer, but it looked horrible. And from what I remember, the guy who actually worked on it, Uh, I think his name is Steve Williams. He worked on Jurassic Park at ILM and a few other things. Um, I think he purposely made it look bad. And I think I remember him saying that so that they wouldn't use it. No. But they did. It got updated, the CGI. And they've updated it a bunch of times, yeah. I, I will say, though, that I think that there are some great improvement shots to the actual Battle of Yavin. I mean, I'm talking about the battle. There's a great shot just above one of the TIE fighters, and it's a dogfight a slow kind of moving uh, dogfight with one of the X wings. It is a remarkable shot. Yeah. It is just huge. You've never seen anything like that. And it, and the way that they added the CGI into the battle of, of Yavin seemed almost as if they were trying to follow the, the way that they were filming the effects in 1977. Nothing looked out of place in my opinion, with the exception of maybe the last couple of shots and when the Death Star exploded. But everything else seemed to be quite organic and worked with the rest of the effect shots in that film. So I like those effect shots, but much of the special editions I cannot stand. Okay. Eric. Yeah. Seven. Uh, Rogue One is my choice. Uh, It is boring. Um, I hate all the characters. uh, With the exception of one great scene uh, in the middle which is the confrontation on Adao, Edu, whatever it is Edu. where we learn um, where um, uh, what's her face, what's her name uh, Jin, Jin, Jin. she's watching her father 
get executed and you know the x-wings show up and everything explodes and i think a lot that ha- a lot of that has to do with uh Giacchino's fantastic scoring of that sequence it's really really well done um having said that rogue one really does suck because of michael Giacchino and that absolutely horrible uh, the theme, theme that yeah. uh, the title card the title card is, is hilariously bad and that theme is terrible it is it is as if it's going to play star wars and it just seems out of tune um but i will say though that the rest of the themes that he came up with are gorgeous the the guardians of his will the, the wills theme is beautiful Chikino's the real highlight of this film and the fact that he put this all together within four and a half weeks is actually quite impressive um but yeah it's it's a it's a good looking movie but i don't care about any of the characters um except for the robot and yep. so when he died i actually did feel something but he's a robot um and the rest of it yeah vader probably should have only shown up at the end i think that would have been far more impactful and way more surprising but um it's just middle of the road and i i, I don't really want to revisit it but i would again would rather revisit it than any of the other films on my list cool from eight to eleven all right bob solo all righty nine number seven yes yep. number seven I went into this film praying that it didn't suck. Everybody was saying, God, please don't suck. Please don't suck. So to the point where um, in the opening text crawl of, uh, well, of The Force Awakens, I burst into tears because I was so... I never thought that we would see yeah. Star Wars on the big screen again after the lambasting that uh, the, pre- the prequel trilogy got, especially after, and, and I've made reference to this before, the Plinket reviews. And a lot of people were like, yeah. Um, and, to be f- and to be fair, there are things about the prequels I do like. And again, I've softened on the prequels, but those Plinket reviews are spot on in a lot of cases when it comes to the to the prequels. In any case, Force Awakens, it had to be good or it would have just sunk the entire trilogy. <laughs> Unfortunately, the other two films kind of did that for it. But um, you have to admit that when Han comes on the... Uh, the, mm-hmm. the 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 Millennium Falcon and says Chewie, we're home. Goosebumps. I got a little yeah, I got I got a little goosebumpy and a little bit to lump in the throat. But yeah, there was there was so much emotion for me at stake when that when that opening crawl started, and I was like, yeah, new new star new Star Wars, and like I said, I thought that it I thought that it it it, it had been completely ruined by the by the prequels. However. It got completely ruined by the sequels, but that's another, <laughs> that's completely a different story. Uh, but yeah, that's my number seven, uh, Force Awakens. Uh, the only thing I'm going to add is uh, during the entire prequel era, the one thing I missed the most that made it feel not like the Star Wars that I remember was Han Solo not being in the prequels or a Han Solo-like character. Mm-hmm. And to see Han Solo in The Force Awakens brought back a certain kind of Star Wars ingredient. It's almost like David Lee Roth returning to Van Halen. That's a yeah. that's that's an analogy. Okay, so my number seven is The Last Jedi, which is this the highest ranking for The Last Jedi of any of us? So um, far. I put that so we far. need to cut the entire opening battle scene with the fucking bombers. We need to cut the entire Finn Rose side plot that goes to Canto Bite. And then you have a good Star Wars movie. And I know this because I've watched The Last Jedi more than any of the sequels, even though I don't like it more than the other sequels. I feel like if you cut those things out, you actually have a pretty good movie there. Um, Ryan Johnson went out of his way to defy fan theories and expectations. I think that's clear. And I think that was a mistake. Um, I also think that Ryan Johnson was just given carte blanche and he didn't have a plan nobody had a plan for wrapping up the story in just one more movie as rob alluded to it should have been you know you needed two more movies really um eric alluded to this whole you know uh, the, the arms dealers which we never have really delved into before in star wars that was interesting but there's not enough time to deal with it 
uh, The Last Jedi didn't, it was not the middle film in a trilogy. It opened up way too many new threads to be, you had Broom Boy, which was an interesting thread. Like, hey, he's got this kid and he's got the force. What the hell's up with that? Is he going to be one of Ray's students in the next movie? No, because we never got to that. Um, you know, there, there was like so much stuff in that movie that well, uh, we never got to that. <laughs> you know? And I just, I just felt like it, 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 it took the whole trilogy in a detour, and it was uh, a bad, bad call, Ripley, a bad call. And whether you blame that on Ryan Johnson, who I believe deserved, he wrote, directed, and you know, I think that's, that's who I'm going to blame. Uh, I don't think he understood the role of the second last movie in a nine movie saga. It's not, you open it up into this avenue of, Hey, let's look at arms dealers and let's look at the, you know, the, the, the upper crust and can't, you know, it, fuck. It's like great, great ideas, but not for the second last movie in a nine movie saga. That's my rant on the, yeah, you know what? I've, I've rated it higher than all these other films and I'm ranting at it. <laughs> uh, I think it's beautiful though. I think it's a beautiful movie, which I believe George Lucas agreed with me on that. That was about the nicest thing he said about it. And uh, I, I, I love Frank Oz returning as Yoda. That was, I don't care for shit if that was fan service. That was, that was lovely. I really loved that. I like that he was a puppet. He, yeah. He and he like looked like Empire Yoda. Puppet. Yes. Yeah, he looked like the Empire puppet. Yeah. Ah, anyway, that's my number seven, Last Jedi. Harrison, your number six. The Last Jedi. Ah. And yes, as you know by now, I'm probably not as hard on these last two films because of how hard I am on The Force Awakens. So I really do quite like The Last Jedi. It tried new things, which The Force Awakens didn't. And it not all of them worked, but I respect it for trying in the first place. Um, it's very artistic, very cinematic. It's probably one of the best looking of the entire saga, and I like that as well. Um, it has my favorite character of the entire sequel trilogy in it, which is the short-lived Captain Kennedy, the uh, <laughs> commander. I love his attitude that he's just so dumb with all the these incompetent young people. He's just like, we'll need to scramble our fighters. Five, five bloody nine. minutes ago just like he's and not he trying to with a smear on his face just yeah he's not trying to penetrate our armor he's taking out our surface cannons is another thing he yells you know at what, i'll give you like, a point for that harrison and, um, <laughs> i love how just like when he, the dreadnought's exploding in front of him and it, death is coming from he's like <laughs> he's just like indignified that he has to die by explosion like all these other common people it's like i don't deserve you don't deserve to kill me like this I love him. And to defend some of the things said about the Holdo and Poe dynamic, like Poe's a fighter pilot, Holdo is commander. I could completely get why she doesn't trust him, especially because something just as unprecedented has happened as tracking through light speed. Like you want to keep the cards close to your chest. Who knows where the mole is? Even if Poe himself isn't, something could be let slip. And Everett, Poe seems to think he's entitled to know everything just because he blew up Starkiller base and got a whole bunch of bombers killed to take out a Dreadnought. Um, Finn's sacrifice, I'm glad that didn't get pulled off because it would have, oh God, like Finn, this massive cannon that's firing superheated, well, heat, and Finn think, and Finn's flying up it. He should have had his face melted off by then. He should have been dead. There's no way his ship should have even a a approached that cannon, let alone actually done any damage to it when it hit it. And everyone's acting like he would have saved them all when it happened. And I'm just like, no, thank you, Rose. You spared us from a completely idiotic moment. <laughs> and he's right for the for the for arms another dealer. Idiotic moment. Yeah. Well, for less another idiotic, idiotic moment. You're right, Rob. <laughs> Less idiotic, in my opinion. And oh, the my arms lord. Deals. Yeah, let's crash another ship in another ship. That'll work yeah. because I love you. And for the arms dealers, yeah, it's a nice touch, but we know for a fact that ties are manufactured by CNR fleet systems and X Wings are manufactured by Incom. And saying that there are people selling stuff to both sides of the resistance goes against the fact that CNR fleet systems have been a customer of the Empire for ages and would likely provide them the stuff themselves and sell it to them directly themselves and Incom actually provided at least in the old canon or maybe the new stuff they provided plans to the rebellion to build x-wings so the idea that there are people other people that are selling weapons to the first order resistance just doesn't seem possible to me or like probable that. based you know, on i i have what... to do this harrison <laughs> amazing 
the uh, fact that you knew those names of those companies. Incom, yeah. Incom and what CNC Cienar. was the other one. Were those in the books? Cienar. I have. I I applaud you on that one. That's a deep cut when it comes to knowing that kind of stuff. And I mean, I just don't. I I, I pride myself on knowing Star Wars. And holy crap, you nailed that. But didn't they awesome. toss those books out into the trash and say they weren't part of this? Possibly. Yes, I'm not but... sure exactly where the income um, association with the rebellion was, but I know for a fact that at the end of the day, CNR and Income Incom were still the manufacturers of those ships. So it seems to me that they could have just gone directly to the manufacturers to buy their ships and wouldn't have to go to arms dealers that are selling to both sides. I think I think if they did the arms dealer subplot as a way that the the you know the the rebellion or whatever they're called now the the resistance. the resistance you know they're decimated and they need ships right so now you send a couple of people out to go find that and they have to now go into the underground and find it. and then they realize that this underground is the major supplier to both of them and then that becomes a moral tale whether they're going to accept these you know vehicles to help kick you know kick ass or not and i think that makes the story much more interesting and very different but not exploring that and just like you know they just kind of threw it away and mm -hmm. why bring it up if you're not going to explore it so yeah the thing the other thing about the, the last jedi it also feels like it's complete Right? There's nothing mm. left to tell. It feels like a movie. It's done. Right? Whereas at Empire, you're like, all right, you know we're going to Tatooine to save Han Solo. It's right. That's what we're looking forward to. There was absolutely nothing to look forward to after Last Jedi. 100%. It was um, done. And I'm that's gonna, dumb. I'm, I'm just going to say one more thing, and then we'll go to Eric's number six. Um, I agree with you 100%. When my sister and I saw The Last Jedi, we came into the theater, and both of us felt like something weird was going on with our personal feelings about it. We had no anticipation for chapter nine right it's like bleh, I, bleh, that's it anyway eric your number six uh my number six is uh revenge of the sith this one feels like a competent star wars movie within the prequels um there's still some things that are a little weird but i i'm following the plot points the story points and they all seem to make sense and they lead to something rather satisfying there's still some stupid stuff in it no is laughably bad um but i think that he did it right the the way the way to end the way to end this series it seemed like he knew the story that he was going to tell and he ended it the way that he needed to and it seemed somewhat satisfying but there was another screenwriter involved and uh, i think that helped uh, with the with the storytelling and i think that again a, a bit of a darker picture the pg-13 rating also helped them tell that story i'm going to tell you right now anakin with the younglings and that lightsaber blast and the kids reaction that's heavy is one of the it's heavy and it's one of the best acted scenes in the entire star wars like saga. i wonder i wonder what really happened like if george kind of just went boo yeah no, it was hayden it, right? it was hayden that went boo and got oh, it. was it really that was a real yeah. Thing? good yeah good and then again, that's all done off screen, and I think that's it's amazing. But you know what's happening, um, and I and, and I think yeah, it, it really works for me. Um, it, it's a fun uh, intro. I mean, it went on a little bit too long. Um, some of the humor again doesn't work, but uh, it's a it's probably the most satisfying of the prequels, in my opinion. I agree. Okay, Rob, number six. Number six. Uh, I'm going to keep this short because this has been mentioned before. Solo, number yeah. six. Um, I enjoyed it um, for a lot of reasons. Um, I thought that Han knowing Wookiees speak <laughs> was a little bit, yeah, but uh, why has that never and, come up before? Exactly. Donald Glover mm, nails the Lando character perfectly he calls him han and i love it <laughs> yes <laughs> and that and and the unfortunately i who's the actor that played han solo aaron anyway, Golden aaron, aaron, aaron aldridge yes thank you um there is okay i'll i'll say this very very quickly Comfior played um pierre trudeau in the, in the miniseries he doesn't look like him 
but he caught the essence of Trudeau. That's how I feel that this watching it, watching solo again, he caught the essence of Harrison Ford's performance, if not the look and the, um, cause there was a lot of people who were saying this actor should have been done because it's closer. Mm. He looks closer to, um, to Harrison Ford. Mm. No, I think, I think he did the best he could. Also, it's one of the very few Star Wars films that only you only see a lightsaber right near the end. Right. Um, and that's uh, Darth Maul. And but I was happy that there is a lightsaber in every single Star Wars movie. Yeah, but and I, and and I, I'll speak to that when we get to Rogue One. Okay. Um, yep. In, in Good. Case. So, but yeah, my number six, uh, Solo. The only <laughs> critique I have of Alden Aaron Reich is that. Yeah, right. He, he looked good. I have no issues with him. I, I, his voice was too high. That's yes, it, it was. Yeah, his voice wasn't very high, but his right. mannerisms. Sort yes, of I, I don't. I don't critique his his uh, performance at all. I thought he was good. Mm -hmm. My number six is the highest ranking for this film, The Rise of Skywalker. And I guess I'm more of an apologist. Uh, I wrote that uh, The Rise of Skywalker is the best that could have been done given Carrie Fisher's death. And the dog's breakfast that was The Last Jedi. I feel that, just like Rob, it would have worked better as two films, but then you're out of the trilogy format, and you can't do that. It breaks the rules. Which is unfortunate. It really should have been two films. Um, I feel that the biggest weakness re-watching this is the awkward, forced Carrie Fisher scenes. It's so obvious that the dialogue is just random shit that they found on the cutting room floor. And it makes me so sad. Um, because of what could have been if Carrie Fisher had lived and they'd been able to write the third movie as like Leia's film, just like, like they were going to like JJ promised her, you know, um, I I'm, I'm pleased that none of you guys have really complained about the whole Palpatine resurrection thing tonight because I, I, <laughs> I had no, it. you hated it. Uh, I'm hated behind. It. That's just beyond the point of no return for me. Here's, That's here's already the thing about that in 1992 or three. I was in a comic oh, book store up in Port Elgin and they had a, a, a Star Wars comic book called Dark Empire. Dark Empire, yep. And what was the plot? The Emperor's resurrection in a new clone body. But so they young... lifted this directly from Dark Empire, but which was a critically acclaimed comic in the early 90s. And now, all of a sudden, nobody likes this idea anymore. Um, I thought, personally, and again, this is just me, We've all had our chance to talk about the rise of Skywalker. I was 100% satisfied with the dialogue. The dark side of the force pathways <laughs> many abilities that some consider to be unnatural. I was, as soon as he said that, I'm like, I'm good with this. I'm good with it. This is what, this is what he was talking about. It's uh, like poetry, it rhymes. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and to, to speak of Lucas's poetry, I, I, I would raise a middle finger. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, there, I agree with all of those flaws that you guys had mentioned, you know, shoehorning Lando in at this, in this kind of, sure, he just happens to be on Pasana, the last place that him and Luke were looking for this relic. And it's just, it, Leia sent me a message. There's so much proxy in this movie on behalf of Leia. Leia said this. Leia said that. Leia, Leia now needs to gather all of her strength to communicate with her son. And it was just so. It was so sad. It made me so sad. You know, this is obviously all stuff that Carrie Fisher would have been doing in the film. You know, and it's it, it, it it's so sad. I I love Carrie Fisher. She's one of my favorite people that's ever been in Star. I'm getting a little emotional here. Um, it was not the farewell that Carrie Fisher needed that movie. And, and the last Jedi with the Mary Poppins thing also was not. So I, she's the one who's been the most, you can talk about Jake Lloyd. You can talk about Ahmed best and all of these people, Hayden Christensen, but God, it's Carrie Fisher. I feel the worst for because she deserves so much better to go out on than the rise of Skywalker. And it, it's so sad, but on the whole, what I wanted out of the sequel trilogy, and this was what I felt was impossible. It was not only do you have to have a trilogy that has a one, two, three story and you're over, but it has to somehow also have an overarching connection to the very first one. 
which I'm like, that was never set up by Lucas. He made he meant to make six films. There's no overarching story. How the fuck do they do this? And they shoehorned in the Palpatine thing, which it, which I was like, okay, I'm I'm okay with this. It it's a nine movie story now that doesn't feel like six plus three. In that way, it still is six plus three though, because unfortunately, the true story is George Lucas made a six movie <laughs> series. He didn't plan on this. I don't care what anybody says. He did not plan on this. You, I know that he had his own trilogy in mind, which I call the midi chlorian trilogy because that's what he's talking about making. But George Lucas made shit up as he went. Nobody can convince me otherwise. Revenge of the Sith being, I, I think he had some solid ideas of how he wanted that one to end and dovetail. But I think otherwise, he was just like, ah, oh, shit, Han and uh, Luke and Leia? Brother, sister. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, and, uh, the, you know, <laughs> Obi-Wan. Hmm, he doesn't, he, no, no, not Yoda, not Yoda. Uh, uh, Liam Neeson. <laughs> anyway, Rise of Skywalker is my number six. Let's go on to Harrison with your number five. Yeah. Just quickly, I wasn't around in the early 90s, but the idea of bringing Palpatine back in a clone body it was complete is complete ass to me. I hate <laughs> that idea, regardless of where it crops up. But like I said, you know, Rise of Skywalker is past the point in no return for the sequel. It's a case of just have fun with what you got. And Palpatine was admittedly fun in that one. But my number five, Attack of the Clones. I like Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones quite similarly. I I, it's Phantom Menace is probably the better movie, which is why I haven't talked about it yet, but Attack of the Clones has better characters to me. Jango Fett and Count Dooku are two of my favourite characters in the entire saga, so just getting any scene with them I really like. You know, it's got higher highs, I think, than The Phantom Menace, but also lower lows. But the thing that I think really messes with Attack of the Clones is the flip-floppy nature of it, going from Padme and Anakin to Obi-Wan to Padme and Anakin to Obi-Wan back and forth with vastly different styles and tones between that. I think it it doesn't do the film a service. As Eric said earlier, one of the weaknesses to some of these films is when the heroes are split up. Mm. Okay, yeah. Eric, your number five. <clears throat> My number five, and it's a film that I... Uh, everything from now on are films that I absolutely love. Okay. I didn't expect to love solo a star Wars story Wow! and I went into it and this is one of the first films uh, I saw in IMAX. Um, it was by accident. It was the only ticket left. I took my son to it and uh, for some reason I could see everything. <laughs> It was a bit dark, but when I finally saw it on video, I'm like, oh my God, this is dark. But when I saw it in IMAX, I don't know whether it's the way they were projecting it or whatever, it looked fine. Um, but it also sounded incredible. I mean, IMAX sound is like nothing else. Um, and so I was just sucked in from that one. But I also wanted to, I wanted to see a Han Solo story, but I was also very curious as to whether Alden Ehrenreich was going to get this right. He wasn't my first choice. I saw him in the, de uh, not Death of Salon, um, uh, there's that Caesar movie that he was in, and he wasn't particularly Bell that. Caesar? Yeah, he wasn't particularly that great in it. And I didn't think he was the right fit. Um, the guy I wanted, and we were all talking about somebody who was mimicking Harrison Ford, was um, Anthony Ingruber. And um, he does an incredible Harrison Ford impression, but I guess that's not what we need. Right. So I thought, this is like my Tom Cruise rule. If I see Tom Cruise in a movie and I continue to see Tom Cruise in the movie, then that movie's shit. But if Tom Cruise turns into his character, an example is like Magnolia within the first five minutes, then I'm okay with that. So I thought this guy's got to pull off Han Solo in, in five minutes and he does it in spades. Again, the voice doesn't match, but all the, the, the grin. inflection, the grin, grin, the mannerisms, the look, the costume, the way he interacts with Lando sensational sensational and on top of that i honestly do think that this film contains two of the greatest action set pieces in the entire saga that train sequence is mm -hmm. amazing but then you get the kessel run which i thought that's fan service how are they going to pull this thing off 
And once you get that past that first five minutes with the uh, with the TIE fighter and uh, the Star Destroyers, but then they head into that cloud with that freaking monster or whatever, and then they have to get the you know the the engines back online. I'm freaking out. This is Star Wars. There's suspense. The music is building and building and building. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. After that, the last third is kind of uh, kind of weak for me, but. I really love this film and it, and it's because it's a it's a it's a linear story. We're with Solo for the whole damn thing for the most part. Yeah. We're following him in everything that he does and we rarely cut away from that. That's and true. I love it. I love his interaction with Chewie. I I I I feel like that they were going to become best friends. Um it, and it's funny. It's it's I think well written. Uh, yeah, some of the fan stuff is like the um, Han Solo. Um, you know, that's the dumb thing. But uh, and again, John Powell wrote one of this century's great scores. I cannot believe what he managed to do with that. And the fact that John Williams was also involved in it to create a, a theme for Han Solo was absolutely incredible. What Powell did with that and how he inserted it into the film, it's just so undermixed, which is too bad. But damn, this is just pure Star Wars fun and that's what i want out of my star wars movie i want to have fun this movie is fun the only thing i'm going to add to that is what i like about the kessel run is that they the same explanation uh in the film as they did in the old star wars legends as to the parsecs thing which is yeah. the kessel run is literally these black holes and you literally have to find the shortest path right so I like that that carried over because there's very few explanations to the parsecs thing that actually make sense. So yeah. good, good on them. And it was it was just so much fun. I, I don't disagree with you, yeah. man. I mean, like I, I I did say dumb fun, but anyway, yeah. yeah. Uh, Rob, your number five. Yeah, we've we've talked about this film. I'm just going to get right to it. Uh, the Last Jedi, which is uh, high up for me. Um, the reason why, again, this is a film that had the potential in my head, canon. Um, really was going in the scene where um, just after Snoke's been killed mm. and there's a um, there's this exchange between Ray and Kylo where she um, he goes join me right. and I'm like is she going to join him yeah. and that at that moment I was like they should end it here and then it would have, and then that would have been absolutely like, or almost ended it there. And I'm and like, then you don't know. And then you don't know until the next film. And then that would be the, the empire strikes back moment. That would be the, you know, the Luke, I am your father, um, uh, uh, moment in, in the, uh, in the series. Uh, I, I, there is also the scene prior to that. I thought that the lightsaber battle with the um, the Praetorian guards, I love it, was extremely well done, and was probably the best two minutes in that film. Mm. Um, just from a from a uh, just that battle, the just that battle style. I mean, I know there are you can if you watch it slowly, some of the guards are in the background and they're kind of waiting for things right, to yeah. happen. Hundred percent. But, but you can you can see the battle. It's clear. It's not being hidden behind CGI crap. It's being, it's, it's two minutes, in, in my opinion, two minutes of glory. In, and I have timed it. <laughs> That's why I know it's about two minutes. It's two minutes of glory in that film. Um, there are, again, a couple of moments in it. Um, the absolutely wasted character of JD. DJ. Um, DJ. Or DJ, whatever his name was, I don't give a, f and it, you'll, and this will be a first. I didn't give a fuck about his character. I really didn't because he, it was a complete. He had a, it, it's. I really like. Was it Benito? It's Benicio, Benicio del Toro. Del, Benicio Benicio del Toro. Del Toro. I like him. Yep. He's a really good actor, but he was just wasted in this film. Yep. Absolutely wasted in this film, and I was like. Ah. And this is your number five. And this is my number five, <laughs> but I still like. I still like. I still like. Can Canto bite didn't need to, didn't need to be necessary. It wasn't necessary, but there is so much hidden potential in this film yeah. that that's why I kind of like 
watching it and going, um, uh, Eric, we've just, we discussed this on a, on a, on a, a show about the, the, this, that it should have been Leia that sacrificed herself in that, uh, in that, uh, hyperspace, um, instead of Holdo. Instead oh, of yes. Holdo. It yes. should have been her. It would have brought the house down. Yes. I and agree. it, and it didn't. Yeah. And they fucking blew it. That's two. And that's you're two, right. Rob. There's no, but two. that's you're right. That's the miss. That's the potential of this film. And yeah. they, you're right. They blew, they blew it. it. There was so much. However, potential. I do. It, it is my number five, and I do. Ha, I do like it. Yeah. I do like it. And above all the other films, I do like it. It's probably the one of the only. It's it's a love hate relationship with me. But yeah, I do like it. So and my only the, additional comment regarding the Praetorian Guard scene is there goes Ryan Johnson specifically going out of his way to defy fan expectations by having no two lightsabers clash at any point in that film. But then, he, you know, he kind of, he did, I agree with you, Rob, he saved it. That's a good battle. I like that battle. I like it a lot better than any of the prequel battles. I stood and clapped when um, Ray throws the lightsaber. Yeah. And he turns it on and it goes right through the head of the, the Praetorian Guard. And I said, holy shit that was cool and i stood up and i went yes awesome you haven't been the, uh, the knights of before. ren though what's that i'm sorry shouldn't that have been the knights of ren uh that? it was going to be at one point but they changed <laughs> their mind and they felt that they wouldn't i don't know whatever my i'm number, gonna get to my number five, my number five the potential five. the potential yeah, yeah. <laughs> the knights of ren ren was one um my number five and i'm not going to say very much yeah. at all here because we all have, is Revenge of the Sith, my favorite of the prequels. I feel that the entire opening battle needs to be scrapped. That elevator scene, I hate the oh, elevator yeah. scene so fucking much. I really don't like Grievous. Um, good movie otherwise. Uh, the endings, endings, plural, are everything that I really wanted, um, except I would have liked to have seen the Yoda landing on Dagobah thing that was cut. Um, I, I really, I, I still get emotional at that ending when Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru are, there's the double sunset, you know. And again, we have to put ourselves back into the shoes of 2005. This was the last Star Wars. That was it. That double sunset was it. Of course, JJ tacked on his double sunset. But, <laughs> but you know, the emotion of that film, I think, is mm, maybe the highest feelings generated sometimes of the entire nine movie saga at certain points um i, I do hate certain aspects of it though Bra dying of a broken heart i don't know if that's ever happened in the history of medicine i'd like to see some documentation Didn't on that what's a carry you know what that's that's sad but true mm. yeah carrie fisher's mother died like her mother died what days after yeah. her right uh, died of a broken heart yeah. so you know maybe it does happen but I don't know. I didn't buy it. I didn't buy that. Debbie Reynolds was a lot older than Natalie Portman. So, I, and again, maybe maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about that whole Leia remembering her mother thing. I don't buy that either. Oh, she imprinted a memory in her while well, she held her. I don't buy that. No. Leia, in the legends, Leia remembers her birth mother dying at a very young age but she remembers kind of like being in hiding in hiding places with her mother hiding from the empire and that's what i wanted an honest person can still be wrong she could think she remembers her mother i don't it, it shouldn't be in the film that's what that, i that, know yes here uh, here's the thing about that and i'll say it quickly all that luke asks is if she remembers her mother your real mother and but does he say the real mother yes yes but and does she know that I don't know. Does she know <laughs> that? Does she know that her adopted mother is not her real mother? I don't know. I don't know, Eric. Hmm. So I that's. Know. I mean, that that's the only explanation that I get from that for her to say what she did. But again, that's just so stupid because George Lucas is so stupid. This is why I keep saying he's making it up as he goes. He is. He decided he wanted Luke's mother to die. What in Legends? Luke's mother disappeared. He went into hiding. You know. Yeah. And, and died when Leia was very young. Anyway. That's my number five. We're going to Harrison with your number four. Solo. So much fun. Unlike Rogue One, I loved every character. Woody Harrelson's Tobias Beckett is awesome. I love him. He was Woody Harrelson. <laughs> Donald Glover's Lando is perfection. Yeah. 
as good as it gets. And even Paul Bettany's Dryden Voss was a really fun villain. I love when he's. I love when he when like the, Beckett's taken off with the coaxium and Han and Beckett and Dryden. He's just like uh, Han. I think maybe we should uh, renegotiate our relationship. And Han's like, Yeah, you first. <laughs> yeah, I love Paul Bettany, but that one that one didn't do anything for me. And don't forget that's kind of salvaged from mm. a previous scene that was shot with the original directors. Right. Um, all the Paul Bettany stuff is from the uh, Ron Howard reshoots. Eh, I don't buy that either, Frank. I don't buy that either. Anyway, Eric, you're number four. Yeah, one more thing on Solo. I will say that one of the most pure Star Wars moments of all time is Han and Chewie seeing the Falcon for the first time. It's fan service, but holy goodness gracious. (laughs) I'll give you that. And Solo's playing the Star Wars main theme over top of that. Now that is a moment, a great Star Wars moment. Avengers portals moment <laughs> that JJ <laughs> Abrams couldn't pull off in number nine. I'll give that, that was the ultimate fan service. And it was so good. It was just so good. But then again, the millennium Falcon is a character. Anyway, besides that uh, number four, uh, the force awakens. I will just say this, that it was just great to see a competent star Wars film on screen that I wasn't cringing at at any point from start to finish i love this movie it felt like an original trilogy film because it pretty much was but while i was watching it i was just so invested in just seeing something truly good again and it was a very emotional um moment personally got to bring my family and you know rob's talking about crying reading the 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 crawl and the thing is i was reading it to my son because he he just didn't know what the heck was going on but i started reading names like princess leia and luke skywalker and i thought i'd never read those names again in a star wars movie and it just the emotions i was welling up i couldn't believe it it was just so silly but then you know everything just unfolded and on top of that i didn't want to see a flashy lightsaber fight and what i got was an empire strikes back styled lightsaber fight with some drama and that's what i appreciate the attacks were all they all meant something and and it felt like there was weighted drama in this film and uh, i didn't like the way it ended but that's the way jj abrams ends anything and everything um but besides that uh having harrison ford back Lawrence Kasdan writing some of the best lines in Star Wars again. Like, that's not how the force works, is one of the funniest <laughs> damn things I have ever heard. And oh, Harrison you're cold? Ford pulls it off. Yeah. And, oh, you're cold. <laughs> it's just... I don't care what it smells like. That's it's, it feels like a callback to that. <laughs> right. just, yes, it is. But it right. does, but it's but it's Kasdan again, a I'm guy who understands Kasdan. Star Wars. And JJ Abrams, say all you want. The guy can direct the direct the hell out of a scene, he can shoot a great scene. And the editing was crisp. The special effects were fantastic. That Falcon chase was incredible. So it's a competent Star Wars movie. And that's all I wanted. Yeah. And that's exactly what I got. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. All right. Mr. Daniels, or Mr. Solo, I should say. Yes, number my number four. First of all, I would like to apologize for the two F-bombs that I dropped. No, nope, no. Nope. Do not I, apologize. You your apology, Rob. I consider that to be a rare but very, very special moment. Okay. Clip that. Clip that. (laughs) In any case, my number four uh, has been discussed, and uh, it's it's Rogue One. Uh, I loved this. I love this film. I when I first saw it, I was like, "What the hell is this?" (laughs) Then I went back and went, "There are some really good moments in this film," and I have to admit, Donnie Yen as Truett Emway absolutely nails the blind swordsman is there something wrong with you i am i oh man that scene just makes me howl every time Mm. when i see it and much like ray park with darth maul donnie yen is very accomplished uh a very accomplished martial artist so to see him in action he was the one character in the film that i actually felt something for uh krennic yes uh urso yes k2so yes his best scene was when he slapped andor and uh and and apparently it was a apparently um 
uh, the actor who played Andor was laughing because he wasn't expecting it to happen. So you kind of see him hiding, hiding his laugh behind the, behind the, uh, the, but yeah, the Darth Vader scene fan service. Yes. But it brought him back to being a badass again and not a whiny bitch like he was in, in, uh, in, uh, return, uh, revenge of the Sith. Agreed. Agreed. So now All I dropped, right. the, now I dropped the B word. Hmm. My... You only got five more left. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, I gotta get my file. There we go. My number four uh, is The Force Awakens. Um, and I, I've said this already. The problem with the sequel trilogy was always that it was never set up in any of the previous six films. So it was always going to feel tacked on. We have to come up with a new enemy. Let's make it the Empire. They're back. <gasps> okay, yeah, let's do that because there was so much backlash to the prequels. So much backlash that George Lucas said, fuck you guys, I'm not making any more movies. <laughs> you know, you if you guys are gonna ask me and beg me for years to make episodes one, two, and three, and then shit all over them. Why do I bother? You know, I'm too old for this, yeah. says George, and rightfully so. Um, I was down on a lot of the prequel stuff, but never to the point where it's like, the, pre the prequels ruined my childhood. Remember that saying? <laughs> anyway, I think J.J. overcorrected, oversteered the ship when he took over, because he basically ignored the prequels completely, did very, very, very little reference to the prequels there was a throw-off line about clones that was it um so he went full-on nostalgia with original trilogy designs because people missed that people they were burned out on the the, the browns and the pastels and all that stuff of the uh of the prequels and you know you really need to remember that this was coming from a place where there was so much hate and Hate leads to the dark side. Hate does lead to the dark side of the force. Hate or just disappointment. I think hate that's or disappointment. Yeah. Yeah. But and but so... you know it's 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 one of those situations where you're 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 in a it, it, there's a no it's a no win scenario. It's a Kobayashi Maru. <laughs> and I like the Force Awakens. Like Rob, uh, like you'd all said you know there's there's a time where you're sitting in the theater going oh my god I can't believe that here I am sitting in this theater again. I never thought this would ever happen. And, you know, when we were kids playing Star Wars with our figures, a lot of the time we wanted to know what happens next. What does Luke do? We didn't necessarily want to know what happened before. How did the Emperor rise to power? That wasn't necessarily what we were doing with our action figures. Our action figures were the next adventure. And you always had to find a new enemy. And the Marvel Comics attempted that with some characters. And there were a lot of novels with a lot of different res resurrected Sa uh, factions of the, the the dark side of the force and uh, you know when they came down to doing the official here's the sequel trilogy they did the empire again and i think that the only reason for that is let's give the fans what they missed about star wars during the prequel era and we need han solo so they paid harrison ford a shit ton of money and a lot of people feel that Harrison Ford phoned in that performance, but I don't buy that at all. Oh, I no. think Harrison Ford was as it's invested fantastic. in that performance as you could be. I mean, there's some, when he, the look in his eyes, when he says, you know, you know, I used to think about the forest, the dark and the light. Well, it's true, man. That gives me chills. That was killer. And I thought the, the final stuff... conf confrontation with Ben. Oh yeah. Killer. Oh, so yeah. uh, and and also like like we said that that line oh you're cold <laughs> there was a lot I of like cool on stuff and and you know tell me you're not dealing wrath tires I'm dealing wrath tires you know there's just so much Han it was a Han movie and it was fun for that reason so Force, Awa Force Awakens is my number four and I will be very brief for my top three because obviously it's all original trilogy <laughs> <laughs> so over to I you will, Harrison with I will say that three. Han's performance in Force Awakens made me wish we had him in the rest of the trilogy. Yeah, I know. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to say one more thing. The, the 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 Han scene in The Rise of Skywalker, guaranteed that was supposed to be Leia, you know? Guaranteed. Uh, but anyway. Would have made more sense, yes. Yeah. Anyway, Harrison, you're number three. I'll just quickly say, I find it ironic that you'll occasionally see people on Facebook saying, oh, they, these old people just like, they say, oh, the only reason the people are liking the prequels now is nostalgia for their childhood, like they weren't kids when the original trilogy came out. It's the exact same thing. It's just, 
we're coming from it from the perspective that now we're the old cars uh, we're the old men yelling at the cloud <laughs> anyway number three the phantom menace in my opinion very solid film i wish maul stayed dead though never cared for him um, I love in the opening scenes how the, the terror of the Jedi when they're doing it. It's like, close the blast door. They're still coming oh, through. I do like and that. Just, like, I do like this that. this dwarf fall apart to the inevitable. We will not survive this. Yes, just like seeing the Jedi in action like that, the fear they inspired. Um, the music went into overdrive because he's John Williams drawing on the entire original trilogy suite, not the entire suite, but uh, he, and then now he's just making so much more good stuff. And I know what, that what a certain member of this panel thinks, but the ultimate edition is the best way to experience the Phantom Menace's soundtrack by far. I'm, I'm going, I'm leaving. Yeah. <laughs> Second, twice, twice Harrison. Yeah. And oh, to talk about boy. Lucas Welburn, one of my favorite things in this film, well, I like the fact that it's pretty linear, you know, it's not flip flopping everywhere. But one of my favorite things is the pod racing scene, particularly the pre grid announcement, because it just makes sense. Of course, this universe will have sports and that they like spectating. Of course, they'll have local heroes and like famous pod racers, of course. And of course, they're going to get their announcement. I just like keep sitting down and just letting this announcement be playing, just watching, you know, these other people going out their lives in the universe. And it just makes it feel real. Like these, these are people, you know, you know, like I forgot, like, you know, like Saboba and, you know, like, Quadraneros. Yeah. And all of that. Quadraneros and he has four engines. Come on. Fuck off, George. Yeah. Don't, off. <laughs> don't go, don't go reading any Harry Potter. If you don't like those sort of names. Um, <laughs> and lastly, um, I will admit that while Jar Jar can be very insufferable, insufferable at times, he is occasionally involved in moments of humor. It's usually involving another character, but I like when he's just like, monsters out there leaking in here, us sinking and no power. When are you so thinking we sit in trouble? And no. in particular, when he's freaking out in the sub and Qui-Gon puts a hand on his shoulder and just says, calm down or something, and Jar Jar you know, goes to sleep. And everyone's just like, I think you overdid it a little. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well Case thought out, you. though. I mean, there, there are things that I do agree with you on that. Yeah, one. yeah. Um, okay. But let's, let's move on. We, we're, we're getting, we're getting late. I, it's dark out here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My number three is Return of the Jedi. Uh, I will just say this. Um, the special effects for the Death Star battle still to this day blow me away i cannot believe they managed to pull that all off um the i'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it when they enter into the, the death tunnel. star and the way they're moving that camera and it's i don't know how they did it but they do it twice but then, <laughs> the best shot is when the um when they fired upon the death star right the the the, the, the reactor they come banking around, you see it explode, and then we have the, the, the Millennium Falcon come right at you, and then the tunnel just explodes on the screen, and we're just ripping by. The imagination yeah. to outdo the Battle of Yavin is and something the trench else. Battle. Uh, or, or and, sort of, well, that, yeah. yeah, and it's just absolutely mesmerizing and i absolutely love the first uh, part of this um the 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 rescue of han solo is a lot of fun the plan's stupid but still a uh, boat load of fun i can deal with the ewoks um uh, but it's uh it's still original trilogy it's still got imagination and it just has these retro special effects that still hold up and i'm constantly blown away when i see it beautiful and I just want to say that the the victory fanfare after winning um, on the, uh, oh, the, the, the oh, Sarlacc yeah. pit is one of the greatest themes ever. And it's only played once and then in vari variation again when the Death Star explodes. Yeah. I, I, right. How does Williams do this and only want to use it once or twice and then just, <laughs> that's it. I'm going to move on. Brilliant. He does, he does the same with Into the Trap. And Into the Trap is using the B theme of the Imperial March that way is fantastic it's it's bloody marvelous yeah. all right bob solo yeah. number three yeah. you want this don't <laughs> you good. anyway good. Uh, but 
that for me, Return uh, Return of the Jedi has the most quotable lines from um, the Emperor. Uh, that I that was a Family Guy reference. I the the, the thing is, I was I was working at at uh, doing some editing one time, and uh, somebody says in the background something about. Uh, um, But is it uh, your, your, oh, your, your overconfidence is your weakness. And I turn around without missing a beat and saying, and your faith in your friends is yours. And for me, um, I love this film for the same reasons that, uh, that Eric just pointed out. It is a fun film. And again, I can deal with the Ewoks. Um, Yeah, uh, there are moments in it that that are a little bit cringeworthy, but not I really, Jar Jar I, Queen I, cringeworthy. I remember. I remember. What's that? I'm sorry. <laughs> not Jar Jar. Queen. Not Jar Jar cringeworthy. No, not Jar Jar cringeworthy. <laughs> um, the scene, the scene with the Rancor, oh, I thought it was yeah. incredible. Yeah, still is. Um, the uh, uh, and the fact that this that this creature was loved and that. Poor rancor keeper, and it it it, it still to me makes my heart go. Oh, he loved that that uh, he loved that creature. Yeah. In it any was the case, worst interaction figure though, the rancor keeper. Oh yeah. In uh -huh. a, in any case, um yeah, my number three, Return of the Jedi. My number three is Return of the Jedi, and the only <laughs> thing I'll add to this conversation is uh, I had a buddy who felt that the most badass line of dialogue in Return of the Jedi was said by Wedge Antilles, and it's when they're blowing the main reactor, and before he's even fired his torpedoes, he says, I'm already on my way out. <laughs> and uh, my, my buddy thought that, that was just Wedge, pure Wedge, badass. Um, enough has been said. Um, my preferred version is the 1983 original, because I believe that Jedi Rocks is an inferior piece of music to Lap the Neck, and I believe that the Man ending um, theme is inferior to the original ending theme. Um, otherwise, you know, there's not a lot of changes that I object to in Return Aiden, of the Jedi. Aiden Christensen showing up. I don't mind that, Eric. Like, I, no I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't get. I, I don't think but it was necessary. But if honestly, the rules, when he did make sure changes, that, so, sorry, what was that? I was just going to say, if they were playing by the rules with the Force Ghost, Sebastian Shaw should have been bold instead yeah, of having, have. having uh, like, But that like, wasn't like an inherited thing. He was, it was burnt off his it head. Burnt off his head. If they look, if they appear as ghosts at the moment they die, he should have been bold. End of story. Well, then, then Otherwise, Kenobi, should have been, Kenobi should have been half a man. That's true. If, you're, if, if, that's, if, you go, if you go by that logic. Well, no, he wasn't cut in half. Listen, he, listen, he, there's no logic to force ghosts. Let's just, let's just agree to Luke that. The, who, Luke's looking at Hayden going, who the hell is this guy? The, the only issue that I had with Hayden's addition, because like I said, I, I don't mind when George did little tiny retcons to tie things together a little tighter. Um, my issue is that Hayden looked creepy again. That's my only issue. Yeah, his stupid schmirk is just terrible. Yep. Okay, Harrison, you're number two. My number two is Return of the Jedi. It has oh. probably my favorite jewel of the pre, not the prequel, the original the trilogy, for sure. It has the greatest space battle in the franchise, probably. I was tossing up whether I like Rogue Ones more, but Rogue Ones was cut up a lot more, so I went with Return of the Jedi. It's a bit less cut up. Um, I, I can deal with the Ewoks too. Should they have been Wookiees? Absolutely. But Ewoks. Are I just understand why he changed that. Yeah, yeah. Plus, um, we got them in Sith. Yeah, true. Lupti Neck is superior to Jedi Rocks, but yeah, I'll give you that. But and I remember as a kid feeling sorry for Malakili, the Rancor Keeper, as well. You know, but, I just um, thought that was a funny scene, to be honest. Like we we laughed. I felt yeah. sorry for him, but I used to feel yeah. sorry for him as well. Yeah, you're right. But my. <laughs> Does that make my me an asshole? <laughs> you said my... it. <laughs> okay, sorry, go ahead. My preferred version of Return of the Jedi is the 2006 DVD, which is basically the special edition. Of Jedi Rocks inferior, yes, but the victory celebration theme at the end of the special edition is one of the best pieces of music in the entire franchise, and I will die on that hill, and I hate Yobnub with a burning passion. But I also... <laughs> 
the reason why I like the 2006 version is because it's before they stuck that abhorrent Vader no in there when he's tossing Palpatine in the can. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Good call. Okay, Eric, your number two. Uh, number two is Star Wars. Um, Which one? Star Wars. Episode oh. four. I know what he's, <laughs> I know what he's getting Star Wars. Here. Right. Um, no bloody A, B, yeah, no, C, no, new hope, or no, in episode four. No, it's, it's Star Wars. Um, I, it's Star Wars. It's a, it's a perfect piece of adventure cinema. Um, good guys, bad guys, space wizards, scoundrels, princesses, great vehicles. Yeah. Just pure fun. A great adventure following these people linearly. Just, there's no breaks, hardly if ever. Um, great bad guy, uh, brilliant music. Brilliant sound effects, special effects. It is a perfect film, but there's one that is more perfect. Yep. I know what you're going to say. One thing I find quite interesting about uh, A New Hope is that they somehow got away with showing burnt corpses on screen. Yeah. I love right? that. And that's one of the most dramatic scenes ever. I don't think I really fully got that until we rented Not it on either. video and I was kind of sitting there in front of the TV. Well, cut off I didn't... arms. Yeah. I didn't yeah. fully like that scene in Flame until I was an adult and I realized what I was actually seeing and yeah. what they got yeah. away with showing on screen there. I think I think that's a universal thing that we didn't get that the first viewing. Yeah. I think that's like the darkest, well not the darkest, but like the most serious thing they've ever shown, and that includes all of Revenge of the Sith. Just, yeah, I I, I I I agree. There's stakes in yeah. this. Yeah. This is the Empire. This is who we're dealing with. Right. They're ruthless. Yeah. Okay, Rob, your number two. There it is. What more could be said than Star, Star Wars? Wars. Uh, it was the film that I fell in love with back in 77, the original release, not the uh, not the, um, uh, the special edition. edition, although there is a couple of editions to the special edition that makes Biggs, sense. Yes, Biggs. Space Battle with I love seeing you earlier. I but love seeing Luke thing, meet up with Biggs. But the thing is, is that yeah. uh, this is the film I fell in love with back in 77, it is number solidly number two, and I can't say anything more than has already been said. Thank you, Rob. My solid number two is The Empire Strikes Back. Um, and in this case, I am actually going to watch the special edition from 97 because very, very little was added. Um, the Wampa scene, no problem. I, I, I have no issue with that. That was such a minor addition, and it looked pretty damn good. Um, and I also like the Cloud City stuff where they of took away windows, plain yes. white walls and gave you little windows to the pink clouds. I thought that yeah. was nice. That looked good. Made that, it less that, claustrophobic. Less claustrophobic, right. more a city in the clouds. And I thought this is how special editions could work really, really, really well. Um, what else was changing that? The Emperor was the changed, Emperor. but not necessarily. I think There's it was a... different, different versions. Uh, landing on is a star destroyer at the end. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that felt really forced. Well, it's, it's it's Jedi. It's unused Jedi footage. Well, no. What I mean was is that the uh, uh, e even even uh, um, uh, Darth Vader's dialogue seems. Yeah. Bring my star destroyer. It doesn't sound like James Earl Jones. It, there, doesn't, I don't, no, it, it doesn't. does. It doesn't. It sounds like James Earl Jones, but he just sounds like he's not into it. He's, There's no line during that in the original, right? He's just walking. Bring me my, space yeah. yeah. Bring, right. bring oh, my right. shuttle. That yes. sounds way better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The I, only uh, issue I have with the Wampa scene, though, is it just it screws with the music. Um, oh, okay. Because if you watch the original, watch the way that Williams is timing the his uh, these little brass blasts with the jerking motion of the lightsaber uh, when okay. Luke is trying to use the Force, and the Force theme is playing over top of that. That goes out of sync completely. But again, I, I don't mind seeing the, the you know full size Wampa, and it's okay. Okay, Harrison, this is it, the last round. Your number one Star Wars movie is... Revenge of the Sith, the ultimate Star Wars film, the culmination of five, or well, technically by the end, six films worth of Star Wars, six films worth the best score in the franchise. In my opinion, Revenge of the Sith is the best score in all of history, and I hate the fact that the soundtrack album is a pale reflection of what was actually played. I want an ultimate edition for it. I love, there's so many duels. I love seeing Dooku again. 
Grievous is cool, even if he doesn't do too much. Um, we got the Clone Wars to expand on that. That opening shot, that opening scene is, I think, one of the best openings in all of cinema. That long, unbroken shot with the music, the whooshing of the engines, just brilliant. Um, what else? Like, so much variety, like the Order 66 scene, so many battles, just it's the, other than the burnt corpses, the darkest, it's, I just think it's the ultimate Star Wars experience. An actual Star War, for once. <laughs> this is true, yeah. Well, thank you, Harrison. I appreciate all of your contributions tonight, even if I might not necessarily agree with all of them. But, um, but you made you know, good the points. only thing I have to say to you is, um, it is it may be difficult to secure your release. <laughs> Star Wars jail. Anyway, Eric Woods, your number one is now. We know what it is. Yeah, it's uh, Ewoks: The Battle for Endor, the sequel to <laughs> Caravan of Courage, released in 1985. Uh, blinking and talking Ewoks. It was brilliant. <laughs> Hey, Those Warwick are freaking Davis nightmare back. fueled movies, man. <laughs> they did get Warwick Davis back, though. Yeah, they did, and I I think they were released theatrically in Europe. They had limited so, theatrical releases, yeah. I believe. Um, yeah, Empire. Um, that's just how you build on a story that you thought was complete. That's how you build on characters, um, and 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 put them in situations that I don't think you expected them to be in. I also think it was completely ballsy to take what was essentially your ending battle and put it at the beginning of the mm. film. That is 20 minutes of some of the most stunning special effects work, stunning music. The asteroid field still remains the best action sequence with the best mm -hmm. scored sequence. That theme was never used again until Powell Good. brought it back in, in, in Solo. solo. And reminiscence uh, therapy. It's just, it's again, Williams brings this wonderful melody that any other composer would just die to have as their main theme for the film. Um, everything about this is pitch perfect. The pacing is incredible. Vader is just ruthless. He's evil. He's incredible. Um, you know, he's just killing guys left, right, and center. It's like, don't do anything bad. There's this he'll force ghost you or force kill you from you know across the I galaxy. I personally always hated how he killed Captain Nita because Captain Nita actually had the balls to take responsibility and apologize. And they just like, no, you oh get treated God, like no. dirt. But Harrison, we're sitting there in the theater in 1980, and he says, I'm going to personally apologize to Darth Vader. My dad and I both are looking at each other You're like gone. <laughs> Wait, as a yeah. douche, Thrawn, my Grand dad's Admiral favorite Thrawn line would have appreciated that. My dad's favorite line is, "Apology accepted, Captain Nita." Vader's a douche. Oh, Thrawn, yeah. Thrawn is a far better commander. Oh well. Anyway. But I also the other thing I'm just going to bring up is um, I think it's the best looking of the Star Wars films, particularly the beautiful lighting during the lightsaber battle, the beginning of the lightsaber oh. battle. Um, I also think the lightsaber battle is the best, and the reason is that oh, yes. you know Luke is is just being toyed with. And there's a little detail where Vader's just using one hand to kick the shit out of him. That's right. Right? One hand on that saber, and he's and Luke is just pounding away at him, and he's doing nothing. Vader's toying with him. And there's I like just how so he lets much... Luke be the aggressor in the beginning. Like yes. Like, yeah. Luke moves in closer. Absolutely. Moves in closer. You, yeah. But I just, the... <sighs> there's, there's just so much drama. And then, of course, you know, the I am your father line it was just a, a stroke of genius yeah and that just sets you up for return of the jedi as to whether that's true or not and that's and I don't how know you... About you guys but when i was a kid we said he's lying well i knew already because i saw return of the jedi first well that's true yeah Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no. um and then of course the the end credits um uh, one of the greatest pieces of music williams has ever constructed uh that is one of the best end credit sweets i've ever heard and that's the reason why you stick around and watch the the end credits yeah. stuff like that so yeah empire is not only just a perfect star wars film it's just one of my favorite films of all time i don't know if you guys have seen this or if it's even real but on youtube there's a a, a clip of some guy who apparently found a vhs tape in a secondhand shop and popped it in and it was somebody who videoed 
Empire Strikes Back back in 1980. Hmm. And he uploaded on YouTube the moment where Darth Vader says, I am your father, and you get the audience reaction. Oh, someone had a tape recorder in the in the uh in the in the theater. So they were recording it and they've just put that to the footage. Oh, I see. Yeah, and they have a similar recording from uh Star Wars as well. Someone brought a cassette recorder in and uh and recorded the whole thing and they uploaded it with the footage. So it's, yeah, nobody really nobody's cool there with a the camera, but yeah, it, it's fun. It's fun to Listen like to the, the audience reaction. I am your father. And then people go, no, <laughs> just like Luke did. Yeah. Like, yeah, brilliant. Mm -hmm. The funny thing about, I find about everyone going, all the kids saying Vader's lying about that. Um, is that everyone was having a meltdown after the last Jedi because they were like, "Oh no, Ryan Johnson made, made raised parents. Nobody's like, it did not con convict. It did not occur to them that maybe Kylo Ren is lying to yeah. get onto her skin and convince her. But maybe. I like the fact that she was nothing. I thought that was a great plot line. And anyway, yeah. Okay, yeah. Rob Solo. No, Bob Solo. I mean, it sh it should be it should come as no shock. Empire Strikes Back. <gasps> I'm shocked. So yeah, it should you should be. Um, one a couple of things that haven't been mentioned: the Imperial March. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so much good music comes from that. Um, I was just at the time just blown away. Vader, not a douche, a freaking bastard. He just was so, as Eric put it, ruthless. And and I thought, uh, what was it, uh, uh, Admiral Piet, when he makes. And when, when he lets the uh, Millennium Falcon get away, he's like, oh, God, I'm, I'm next. And Vader just kind of storms by him. And it's like, yeah, Vader was a um, powder keg. You just don't cause sparks around him and he won't go off. But holy <laughs> crap. Um, probably the only, the... Um, Boba Fett and I had the Boba Fett figure before the film came out. You so I, I got I got the uh for some reason my mom sent uh those little um proof of purchases into and I got this Boba Fett figure and I I didn't know who he was. Nobody did. And then all of a sudden he shows up in the holiday special. I'm like, "Okay." And then he then he shows up as a minor background character in the in the uh in in empire and then becomes this hugely popular character um i liked i liked him until well i won't get into book of boba fett yeah. that's my own my own well, it was actually really the what they did with the mandalorian that set the sowed the seeds for i think boba's changes because they basically nailed the Boba type character with the Mando, I think. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. What did you guys uh, pers first? What did you think about the change of the the voice because of the casting of Django? Oh Fred? yeah, I, I, think I like that. that. Sucked. Oh, I like the continuity. Hate, okay. I okay. Voice. I I will say this for them, they did a retrospective on the character of Boba Fett on Disney Plus, and they acknowledged Jeremy Bullock. They didn't oh, yeah. just like they he didn't was just such a character. Just, whitewash over it no they said jeremy bullock made that character and it was his voice it's great, and it was great and eric i prefer the original voice but like i said i have no issue with things that tie things together apparently george lucas decided that boba fett's from new zealand and <laughs> uh, that's george's vision that's what yep. george wants yep. all the boba fett's are from new zealand so yeah, my my take on and my my final word on this is that um, yeah, Empire Strikes Back. You're right, Eric, with that that scene when we've just we've talked about this. He's toying with with yeah. Luke, yeah. And the um, there okay, couple of two 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 questions that have never really truly been answered, in my opinion. What happened during the dinner? <laughs> they had dinner did they actually sit down and have yeah did they actually have, i mean i know it i know it's been parodied in in yeah. the family in guy the robot, robot chicken, chicken but what happened it's not even in the book what happened I mean, they in, don't, in any case and one more sure. question that um i know it i how did 
Um, how did Luke's lightsaber end up in uh, with that with that woman? And I can't think of her name. Um, Maz Kanata. Maz Kanata. Yeah, I can that's tell it. you, Rob, that uh, the Force Awakens was originally going to open with a montage of the lightsaber falling and ending up in somebody's hands and going here and going there. Yeah, and... I, I read that and I went, okay. I know, I didn't like that either. So the comic explanation is that an Ugnaught found it in the trash and from there it changed hands. Okay. Now that, that I can kind of believe, something like like Quail from, uh, from Mando. I can see yeah. that. I can see him finding it and going, hmm, I'll sell this to whomever. You know, but, I've you know, again, never. this is something that was ripped off from Dark Horse Comics when Luke's lightsaber and hand were discovered and used mm. for evil to create. Well, actually, no, that was not from Dark it Horse Comics. It was the Comics. Throne Trilogy. It was from the Throne Trilogy where they yeah. created the Luke last command. Skywalker with two yeah. U's, the evil version that wielded the blue lightsaber. Right. <laughs> they cloned him from his hand. But, yeah. Kind of reminds me of Lilu from uh, The Fifth Element. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so my number one. The bus. Yeah, well, t pass. <laughs> Corbin Dallas. Corbin Dallas. My, uh, my number one. And, and by the way, Coruscant, fifth element. Anyway, my number one is yeah. obviously A New Hope. And I prefer the 1977 original. No New Hope, just Star Wars, which you can get on the uh, 2006 DVD. Um, I think one of the things I like best about it is C-3PO. Uh, mm. His character became much more prissy after A New Hope. And George Lucas described him as being more like a used car dealer, oily. Yep. And he is that in A New Hope. Like, that R2 unit is in prime condition. I've worked with him before. You know? he, he uh, and, and during the Death Star, you know, oh, the madman. If you go that way, you might catch them. You know? I love how uh, much of a manipulative bastard R2 is in A New Hope, too. He is. He is. Like, the droids were really good characters in A New Hope. And, and that's the way they were written, because they were the perspective characters. Yeah. And yeah. I just, you know, it, there's nothing that you can say to top, you know, a first experience really. And I have such strong memories of the first Star Wars and X-wing fighters and Tie fighters, Darth Vader, and having my own little glow-in-the-dark lightsaber. Except it was probably called Space Sword because I know it was a generic. <laughs> and and Dar Erickson, hi Dar, brings up good points here. The only problem with Empire versus Star Wars is Han Solo was so much cooler in the original. And you know, he's got a point there. He was uh, kind of. The Falcon wasn't working right in the second one. So he's, and he's constantly on the run. He's constantly trying to fix things. He's constantly trying to save his own ass. Yes, Rob. Uh, I was just going to say, but that brings up the charm of Han Solo in the fact that he's, he, that, that it goes back to George Lucas's American graffiti. Yeah. Where um, Solo's constantly tinkering with the car or tinkering with the Falcon. To get it to to get it to work properly and that sort of thing, um, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. Plus, part of Solo's charm okay. is his unwavering confidence in the face of <laughs> long odds. It was yes. it was actually it was fault. good character arc and good storytelling that Han Solo took this kind of, you know, he he got he got a little his <laughs> swagger his swagger was kicked in the nuts a little bit there, you know. It's not my fault. Would it help if I got out? Was that Lando that said that? Actually, it might. oh yeah, what it was. Lin they God. told me they fixed it. Anyway, there's lots of Han Solo being like, "Yeah, holy shit, what's happening now?" And it was kind I love of when to see his character just after so much confidence. You know that the end of A New Hope when he's the one who kicks Darth Vader's ass. Woohoo! It's kind of fun to see him taken down a few notches. And even if Darth Vader has no idea that this is the guy who shot him out of out of the trench, what? Darth Vader really fucking focused on Han Solo. If he folk, he could have tortured any of them. He chose he mm -hmm. chose Solo mm -hmm. to torture, and that was another brutal thing about Vader in in, in Empire. Yeah. Anyway, I've said well, enough. You, yeah, you hear Solo screaming. Yeah. Yeah. I love when the toolbox falls on his head when they. Oh just God, that was Astros funny. Empire films. had a lot of funny yeah. stuff. Like yeah, that. the humor is perfect. Yeah. Um, nothing seemed forced. This is a great forced. script too. Forced. <laughs> forced. <yeah. laughs> All right. Yeah, and, and Lawrence Kasdan really did save that script. Uh, Leia Brackets was pretty shitty. And That's what uh, the, yeah. Kasdan was the savior of that. And I mean, if you have those awesome books uh, by J.W. Rinsler, um, I have the three of them down here. They the go through trilogy? these. Um... 
these massive making of books. Oh, those. Okay, okay. So they're um, in Empire, the Empire one. I think there's about 30 pages of um, transcript because either it was, I think it was Kirshner was holding a tape recorder while they were talking about the um, uh, I Love You, I Know scene and how they were working that out. They basically made that up on the spot. That's right. Because and, the original uh, line of dialogue was like, you better that, yeah. like that. Yeah. And it's they're They're like, this is not the way Han Solo talks. Yeah. And so they're working it out. And those books are, are fantastic. I highly recommend you pick them up. There's an yeah. Indiana Jones one as well. Um, they're brilliant. There's an, I think aliens. He wrote a, uh, alien and aliens uh, making of, uh, he died recently, the wow. author. Um, but they're great, great books. Everything you ever, you ever wanted to know about the original trilogy is in those books. Well, boys, I have had an absolute blast discussing these movies with you. I feel like, even though it's almost 10 o'clock at night, we have only scratched the surface. I really do feel that way, which is a really fun way to leave a show. Yeah. Um, we'll just quickly do the round. Um, Harrison, start with you. What do you got going on this week? Nothing. Okay, great. Move along. Uh, what? Move along. What's going on at Cinematic Sound <laughs> Radio this week? Ah, uh, man, there's uh, there's so much stuff going on. If you're a fan of uh, Goblin, um, one of my guest hosts, J. Blake Fischera, who wrote two fantastic books called Scored to Death, um, he is uh, chronicling Goblin's um, music in film. And uh, part three was just released today. And it's fantastic. I'm not overly familiar with Goblin. Um, so listening to this, um, I'm learning so much. And the music is just fantastic as well. So, yeah, there's going to be a lot more interviews that I'm catching up on and other things I'm doing with the Patreon. Uh, we just did another all request show. Those are always a, a lot of fun. And, yeah, we're just kind of just keep going we just keep going and and you know we're, we're trying to put out some unique content and i hope people listening are enjoying it thank you eric and mr daniels um i can't remember what's going on vision and sound tonight yeah tonight's show is uh the future that wasn't um score our scores that from films that are set in 2022 oh so uh there's a little bit of that and next week is going to be kind of my doctor strange show so I actually got a chance to see the film in the theater last night, um, as I posted earlier on Facebook. Um, I'll just simply say I really enjoyed the film, and we'll leave it at that. Quick question. And, yes. How many people were in the theater with you? It was probably about, well, I saw it in the VIP theater, so it was probably, it was fairly full. Hmm. Like, I mean, I, I, I saw it at a, at a later showing. I actually saw the 1015 show on a Thursday night, which was probably not the best idea, but, uh, <laughs> you know, considering I had to work the next day, uh, in any case, it was, it was the, the audience, I think was fine. It's just, you know, people stay in your seat for the entire film, please <laughs> Yeah. quit getting up and going to the bathroom or quit getting up and going wherever. Like, really, can you not sit for an hour and for, for two hours and just watch the film? That's just me. I, I'm very much if I if the only the only reason I would have to get up at all during a film is if I got a very if I got a phone call during it, which I has happened. Yeah. Or if I really have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I, I stay will, put. I will stay put for most. I get part, comfortable. Most of it. Yeah, I get comfortable. Exactly. That's what you get. All right. Sorry, Harrison. Oh, and what? Sorry, one more oh, thing. No, I wanted just going to be able to... um, a lame, a lame attempt at humor. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say one one thing, and that was uh, the uh, one thing I was going to add to my to my Rogue One um, review or my Rogue One th story was they should have done something with Kyle Katarn. I wish. And I wish they was had. Video I mean, if you're version. not if you're not familiar with the character of Kyle Katarn, um, he is Horses. basically the Chuck Norris of the of the Star Wars universe. Uh, he can do no wrong. And uh, yes, if you are familiar totally with, if you're familiar with Dark Forces, or a Jedi Outcast, or the uh, 
partial game that he was in, which was Jedi Academy, yeah. then yeah, um, he should have, there should have been something about him in, in the, uh, in Rogue One, but you know they what? never, maybe, unfortunately. Maybe Cassian Andor could have just been called Kyle Katarn. Yeah. That would have satisfied um, me. That would have, suffi- that would have satisfied me too. Anyways. I yeah. thank you guys so much for tonight. Yeah, I had an absolute blast. I can't believe we did three hours, but I can because it's us. Wow. <laughs> Star Wars. Yeah. So I'm going to wish you guys all a fantastic weekend. Uh, we are going to go out on a song, as we always do, and in tribute uh, to Uncle Meat, who refused to be here tonight. We'll play mm-hmm. one of his. This is Fairies Wear Boots by Heavy Cutting. Thank you, gentlemen, and we will see you on the flip side. May the force be with us all. Actually, you know what? Just real quick, let's just do this for Harrison. We'll turn off the light here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Harrison lights. (laughs) Nice. All right, guys. Have a great night, and we'll see you all very, very soon.